Good afternoon, our online audience and everyone. I'm Nico Chen, former chairperson of National Communications Commission of Taiwan. It's my great honor to be here today with you at the track of AIOT of Mobile Conference 2020. Due to the COVID-19, so we can only meet online, but I think today's program is, uh, will give you a very uh, prospective, fruit, fruit, fruitful result and uh, uh, your and experience. So uh, today's track, there, are, there will be two panels within AIoT track. The main thing of the first section will focus on web and AIoT in city and the telecom cloud infrastructure. And the second section will talk about AI and the computer vision in the new web era. And the distinguished speakers will share their insights and I will introduce them later. So first, I would uh, ask our uh, first section four speakers to say hello to all of you. First one, uh, Mr. Chen Huiming, Chief Secretary, Department of Information Technology, Taipei City Government. Say hello, say hello to our audience. Hello, everyone. I'm Maya Chen. And the second speaker, speaker is, is Mr. Alan Liu, Vice President of Taiwan Mobile. Hi, this is Alan from IBM Taiwan Mobile. And Quen Rong Luo, Managing Director, IoT Laboratory, Telecommunications Laboratory, Zhonghua Telecom. Hello, Quen Rong Luo, uh, Zhonghua Telecom. And Joyce Chen, Senior Director, Far Eastern. Hi, I'm Joyce Chen from Far Eastern Telecommunications. Yes, we all know that right now we are approaching the 5G and already enter into the post-convergence era. As we have been hearing about AI for a few years with the coming 5G networks, the super high speed, low latency, and low, cons low power consumption design network will facilitate the AI development. Actually, 5G will be the huge platform on which all the information and communications technology, of course, including AI, can be utilized with all the pos possible ways into all different kinds of vertical industries and all around our lives. I always like to describe the future connectivity as Glacier. When I took the position of chairperson of NCC Taiwan, I was responsible pl for planning the 5G and IoT regulatory development of Taiwan coordinating the national high-level security strategic project and also co-working with ICT industry and the internet community and the society. 5G is not only just about fast, uh, faster broadband and lower latency. It's also about enabling the next generation of innovation and entrepreneurship and will make the next digital leap, a true digital transformation possible. According to the reports from many research institutes, top 10 user cases for AI roughly are healthcare, finance, manufacturing, retail, networks, e-commerce, media, education, and of course, government for smarter services. And the most important key issue is that mobile data is one of the major growth drivers within the digital environment. To foster data-driven innovation, we need a new way of thinking and international and intersectional collaboration. So we are looking forward to our four speakers' insights. Today's first speaker of first panel is Mr. Chen Huiming, Chief Secretary, Department of Information Technology Taipei City Government, and her topic is the core of Taipei's smart city strategy, holistic, multifaceted, and citizen-centric. Mr. Chen received her PhD in the field of industry, uh, industrial and system engineering, as well as master degree in labor management, hospital management, and IT management. She was also being listed among the women in GovTech 2019. As the Chief Secretary of the Department of Information Technology in Taipei City Government, Ms. Chen's responsibility is to promote Taipei's policies regarding smart cities, enhancing 
the competitiveness for the whole industry through new technologies and providing citizens with the excellent living environment. Let's welcome Ms. Chen. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Maya Chen. Mm. It's my honor to be here. And today, I will briefly introduce the de developer of Taipei's smart city. Taipei, the capital of Taiwan, its for million population consists of both residents and work from other cities. Urbanization has brought many problems in this city, but Taipei ground public transportation system, high quality talents, strong ICT industry chain, and the race uh, infrastructure have probably reach uh, nutri nutrients for the further development of smart city. Smart city is a dynamic process. They can adjust at any time to quickly respond to uh, citizens' demand. Therefore, we have shift our core principle, principle from five plus one to six plus one. This includes smart building, smart transportation, smart education, smart health, smart environments, smart security, and smart economic forming the core of smart government. The forward will be the de low so for duration. Open government, safe participation, open data, national in judgment, this judgment, this judgment can be decided as from public to private, from internal to as external. When transforming Taipei into a smart city, we integrate our visit with international trends. The pilot project, which follow uh, benefit from tapping into property and private sectors, the farmer private testing uh, field and policy support. We are, uh, while the later private solution with top-down and bottom-up approach, we would together on pilot project and innovate innovation and then promotion and expansion are carried out for successful uh, project. This is our approach to creating a livable and sustainable city. Next, let's take a look at some of our AIoT project. Strain line can be seen as the neural network of a city. We test different sensors, such as ones for air quality monitoring and traffic for surveillance from collecting data, we find it useful 
to solve urban problems. Self-driving vehicle is another key topic. Taipei city government and judges in self-driving vehicle projects in 2016, we tested a protocol on a de uh, dedicated bus lane. The lightning uh, enhanced uh, enhance citizens' awareness of new technology. After the road test, Taipei city government have a testing ground inside the Beitou Shilin Science Park. The area uh, promote, provide open space for all stakeholders to test their self-driving uh, self tech. After two close uh, field, Te, uh, test this event includes the provide status designed to improve tech. In 2019, we worked with a startup and a partnership uh, secure a one-year test promotion from the central government this year. After the first and second stage of tech pre uh, preparation and test, we expected to run self-driving shuttle bus for people nine. Application of IoT and AI analysis. This POC project places centers in a mountain, which provide real-time data. After analysis, abnormal numbers will be sent back to the management. This solution not only reduces time and manpower for data collection, but also minimizes time loss when fighting bush fire. Help us to protect our nation national resources. We value transportation a lot, so I would like to share two smart transportation POC uh, project with you. The first one is the transfiguration problem in Neihu. To face this problem, the Department of Transportation install a six, six, uh, seven, six, uh, three, six, three, six degree face eye detector combines AI at an intersection. The camera also provides instant transfer detection and trajectory of different vehicle type with complex transfer situations. The data is used to transfer line timing control input. 
the second case use high B video detection system to enhance being a process. This allow the city's team to better bear with management of city bus, parking spaces, payments, info, uh, and recursion. Also, data from this project will be e evaluated if introduced of smart tools. Smart tools can help reduce manpower. The public can also get roadside public, uh, parking information so this science, thereby saving time when parking their own cars. Ele uh, electronic fences have a problem with high force along red. To tackle this problem, Main school safe and reduce, reduce the burden of security guns. AI ca cameras are installed to identify human human activity and provide more accurate alarms. Uh, through safe uh, living. Working with Taipei City, a French startup used IoT tech to monitor the vibration and 3D deformation data of search bridge. The cameras also Color, color train fee for data and perform vehicle uh, recognition. Understand how the stability trends under different environment and weather conditions can be help, helpful for the uh, also authority. Being a data-driving city is what Taipei focus on. Therefore, Taipei IOC integrates many kinds of data resource, resources and AI solutions. We hope we can use IOC to in change performance of, of the department to make decision easier. Let's watch this video on Smart City. We hope with the involvement of more and more tech with your our living there citizens can enjoy a more uh, communion, a communion lifestyle. Here is the video.
these are the awards we received in the past. The city government is happy to be uh, honored by so many pro professional organizations around the world. For example, the IMD Smart City Index 2019 uh, Re Re Taipei 7th on the list. In the 36th uh, first surveys, this uh, citizens press our effort in areas such as on and culture, free Wi-Fi, waste management, property transportation, and medical resources. Taipei is a living lab. We welcome city around the world to share your idea and solution. And we look forward to working with you. The city government use in no innovative tech to introduce the real name based mass vending machine with the control uh, with control government. Here is a report by AFP. Go 嗯? If you like to learn more about our words, please scan the QR code on this page and visit our uh, visit. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Chen. Our uh, second speaker uh, is Mr. Alan Liu, Vice President of uh, Taiwan Mobile. Mr. Liu is in charge of enterprise solutions, products development and management, included mobile, fixed network, voice, cloud, data center, security services. His background is science and technology and EMB as well. Let's welcome Mr. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Alan from the Taiwan Mobile. I'm glad to be here to share with you about the, what we have been done for Smart City Project with IoT technologies. In the first time, I want to quote the very in, uh, famous uh, statement here. These two statements from the uh, uh, pair of the two city novel. The writer is Dixon. He say it was the battle of time, it was the worst of time. Battle of times, you know, the last year, the US and the China trade war uh, already disaster of the global supply chain. This is the worst of times. We have a chance to reposition ourselves in the new supply chain. And uh, from this year, we are facing the very serious virus attacking. This we have never had such experience in the past years. It was the age of the wisdom. 
you know, happen to be right now AI, IoT, and 5G technology is getting mature. But machine is smarter than people. Those uh, technology will steal all job in coming years. So this is, I want to share you, this very touch me about the two statements. Let me introduce uh, about Taiwan, the mobile and broadband penetration rate. Uh, population in Taiwan right now is 23, 23 million people. And the uh, household around the 9 million. Uh, Taiwan already have uh, more than 112 Four percent subscriber. One people have more than one phone, mobile phone, and the cable TV penetration rate is five fifty-seven percent, sixty percent about the broadband. Taiwan mobile market position is uh, mobile. We around the have uh, twenty-five percent market share. We have thirty percent the big line market share, and thirteen uh, percent about the broadband market share. We also set up a 5G plus vision for the long-term growth. The uh, first one, the gift. That is the advantage of Taiwan Mobile. We have a big customer base about the mobile phone, cable, and the broadband. Group, we also want to have more synergy with the Momo shop. This is one of the biggest uh, online shopping co 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 company here. And uh, we also have staff as a writer, AppWorks, for the other strategy partnership, want to uh, support the further derived growth. Great, we have long-term vision, more than 10 to 12 years. And also Green, provide more friendly environment support from the all, uh, Strategy. Also, we want to accelerate all transformation into the regional enterprise, not only focused on domestic. Okay, first of all, I have a question for you. What is next of the internet? Internet has been developed for more than 30 years. Uh, right now, everybody have a smartphone connect to each other. People to people, very easy to reach your party, your partner through the internet. This is the age of internet of people. But right now, more and more machine and device already connect to the network. And also the things, machine equipment can talk to each other. So machine can talk to people, can talk to machine, things to talk to things. So this is a new era of the internet of things. So what's next if we have IoT network, but plus AI become the AI IoT. It's more intelligent IoT network. In conceptual wise, IoT have the three kind of layers. First layer is the sensing layer. That is uh, a lot of uh, this device equipment here connect to internet. Second tier. Second tier is a uh, connection tier. Here, maybe have the broadband, maybe a 4G network, but right now it's 5G network is uh, popular. The third tier is the uh, intelligent tier. This uh, process the backend data and with uh, AI capability. So what's important for a smart city. A faster, reliable network is very important. So 5G is getting mature right now. All of the telecom companies already deployed within this year. So there are three uh, very important and uh, powerful capability of 5G here I want to introduce you. The first one is EMBB, faster and faster speed of 5G. It can be download a movie within few minutes, few seconds, sorry, and uh, faster than 4G 10 times. The second capability is ultra reliable low latency connection. 
that's very important for the remote control. For example, a drone, uh, a vehicle, autonomous vehicle, uh, need a very low response time to get back the system information from the back end. And third one is a massive machine type communication. This is very important for the IoT network. Master, most of devices already connect to network. So we'll send back a lot of data and from the different data resources. So this is very important to have capability to connect a million basic devices here. So for a smart city, 5G is very fundamental mandatory network solution here. But why we want to use the 5G AI and IoT technology? Because the data is very important. We connect all devices to the internet and send back to the backend system in order to get the data and the processing, analyzing, and uh, transfer to useful information. So the data value is important for 5G application. If the, we have the faster, reliable network, this will be come true. And also send a lot of bunch of data back to all backend system. So AI and machine learning capability very important here. So new technology is not a rocky science. It has to be provide more meaningful service to the citizen. So from different perspective, a smart city should cover some of the age here. Utility, for example, uh, right now Thai power implement the power meter, gas meter, parking sensor, that well useful for citizen. The second one in uh, provide a air pollution protect detection services is very key right now in this timing. The air pollution is getting worse time to time in this moment. We need a, that a detection system to provide feasible tech data to the all audience and uh, all citizens. Life, medical, smart car, like the right now Taiwan, the IC car for the medical care is very successful. Traffic, in the near future, maybe the autonomous vehicle will become true. Security, camera around the city. Right now, we have more than uh, 20,000 camera in the Taipei city area. This is more secure and safe for all living, but less the privacy as well. This is a trade-off. So I want to introduce the Taiwan Mobile have a couple of uh, smart related the project. The first one is smart computing. Second one is smart health. The third one is smart sports and the stadium and the warehouse and the home. Let me share with you about these six cases. The first one is the uh, AI cloud. Uh, in 2018, we uh, collaborate with the ASUS and Guangda to provide the, this project to the N NCHC to build up a very faster the AI cloud computation, computer cloud. This uh, supercomputer is ranking to top 20 in the world. It has capability can process in the uh, image training in one second, can achieve the 1.76 million images. Also, disease can detection can from one week to 12 hours. And uh, tumor marking can reduce from 48 hours to one hour. The second one is uh, my smart health. This is a very small devices you can wear on your personal uh, devices. These devices can uh, detect the air quality uh, within 30 seconds and send back all the air quality information back to the cloud. 
those information can collect uh, together to share with you and uh, can be uh, information to improve your living and uh, working space environmental condition. This smart health. Another one is uh, we uh, have a predictable uh, air quality detection project. This, this project, we install the stationary resource sensor around 115. And we also install the moving population sensor more than 300. And also install on the sun uh, plant more than 20. This uh, case is very important is to use local team to derive all of the solution. This can predict within next 30 minutes air quality indicator. Last one is the smart support. We have the, one of the APP my support. They have the 23rd type access can be used, record your behavior. And uh, on the right side, we uh, have the professional training AI OT platform. We use the AR solution to train the trainer. And also we install the uh, IoT sensor in the end of this bat. This uh, simulation can transfer precise calculation information to improve the trainer behavior and improve their betting skill. This is my sport. Next one is smart stadium. Right now, COVID-19 impact most of the event already changed to closed door event. No audience go to the sport field. And the other uh, alternative solution is uh, the AR and the BR solution. We implement in all Xinjiang basketball field. We use the AR solution and the 3D replay technology to let the, this uh, organizer and uh, stadium owner have a chance to expand their service through the internet to the home, to the everybody on the mobile phone. This is very important technology to solve this uh, current issue of the COVID-19. The next one is a smart warehouse. This is an uh, autonomous vehicle that is uh, supposed to transfer some heavy material from the A side to B side in the industry warehouse. This can reduce a lot of uh, occupation injury and also saving a lot of labor costs, improve efficiency. This is the reserve for biggest online shopping com company, their warehouse. The next one is uh, smart home. This is very important. It's first the Google Nest Mini in native Chinese language in Taiwan. We can use this uh, smartphone, uh, smart box, can turn on your TV, select music you want to like, select program you want to like, and also can turn on, turn off your living room light and uh, your home appliance. So this is in the initial stage. Right now, we already collab with all Taiwan uh, automatic uh, uh, ecosystem to improve our service. So this is very useful solution in the smart home. So the last one page is I want to share with you uh, IoT service of Taiwan Mobile. Uh, as a telecom provider, we act as a platform provider. We want to collaborate with uh, all of the devices manufacturing in Taiwan and the play as a manual platform, provide connectivity and management. Also invest software and solution vendor on the platform to develop their own solution. Also generate a lot of uh, data can be used for the other AI and big data analytic solution. Right now we have more than 30 partner manufacturing here. So we would like to invite you, if you have interest in, can join with us for the further smart city ecosystem build up. So this is what I have today to share off with you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Alan. Uh, I think Alan has already uh, mentioned about uh, so many applications uh, cases of uh, Taiwan Mobile and already mentioned about the COVID-19. Maybe we can discuss it uh, more uh, later. 
Okay, so let's move to the our uh, third uh, speakers. The third speaker is Quan Rong Luo, uh, Managing Director, IoT Laboratory Telecommunication Laboratory, Zhonghua Telecom, and his topic is AIoT Applications Development Development in Zhonghua Telecom. Direct Law received uh, his PhD degree in the field of double E and joined the uh, telecommunication laboratory as a division project leader, project manager, and then managing director. There, he has involved in IoT key technologies such as device management, big data, and AI, IoT application services such as intelligent transport, intelligent energy serving, and saving and healthcare, wireless communication technologies such as LTE, NB-IoT, and 5G. He's currently responsible for IoT application service products planning and research such as ITS, healthcare, and smart city. He has extensive industry experience. Let's welcome Director Luo. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Today, I will share uh, the IoT appearance uh, to you. Uh, our agent uh, separated into the four parts, but today I will emphasize two parts. The first part will introduce the IoT platform, which is uh, developed by ourselves. The second part, I will share uh, a little bit uh, application of IoT. Uh, first, uh, we look at the I AIoT, the ecosystem. Uh, the ecosystem can be uh, divided into the three parts. The first uh, is a device layer, the second uh, network layer, and uh, uh, the third uh, is application layer. According to the uh, Garner information, we know the top line of these slides. The business opportunity uh, Device layer about 10%, uh, network layer 5%. Uh, the big opportunity, uh, 85%, fall in the application layer. Zhonghua uh, Telecom is a, a telecom company. Uh, from this uh, information, we just share about the 5% uh, business opportunity. Here, uh, we most important things is uh, we need to provide high quality and a high coverage network to connectivity in IoT, uh, <coughs> IoT service. Uh, how to uh, set up the ecosystem? Uh, I think uh, we, can, we don't need to redo uh, the software. We can collect uh, the software module, put together. We have a platform, and we can quickly communicate the application and the device. So, after we can do that, we can emphasize or focus some application uh, uh, service uh, we will mention in the later. The, this is a show the uh, core business of Zhonghua Telecom. There are four uh, business, uh, fixed line, mobile, broadband, and uh, MOD. Uh, our marketing share is the number one in Taiwan. Uh, this is a plan of 5G. Uh, we starting uh, from the year 2018. We joined the uh, international organization. With, in order to take the uh, status of 5G, we joined uh, NGMM, a 3GPP uh, group. Uh, last year, we set up a trial system in the telecom uh, laboratory. Uh, the purpose of the uh, Trial system, we found uh, a pilot team in, in Taiwan. Uh, uh, the company or member uh, include a chipset, a terminal, and a service uh, maker. So we provide uh, uh, this platform uh, for them. Can do, uh, they can do the interoperability test. Uh, this year, we won the biggest uh, bandwidth in Taiwan and the, the zone is based in the uh, 3.5G. So uh, currently we plan where launch uh, the 5G in the drive. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, 
the characteristic of 5G include uh, three parts. The first part is a uh, high speed. The second is a low latency. Uh, the last is a mass connection. I don't uh, uh, talk about, uh, no, no more talk about here. Uh, I think of 5G as an uh, infra, uh, as a platform. Based on this platform, we can combine the engine. Uh, the engine such as uh, big data AI, the funeral like the data. So we can put this together, we can provide uh, our customer for differential service for to be for, uh, for consumer uh, to be for the enterprise uh, uh, customs. Uh, the stretch of Zhonghua Telecom uh, for I I IoT, we can play three loads. Uh, the first uh, law is a uh, network. We provide the connectivity. So currently, we uh, not only provide the 4G and the uh, we, we, we establish the 5G in the future. The second, we can play the platform provider. Uh, we already uh, developed the IoT platform by ourselves. They combine uh, three uh, major uh, modules. We can talk about this in the later. A uh, lot of application of IoT, we can do not uh, we can finish, we cannot finish by ourselves. So we must be to cooperate with uh, the uh, service innovator. Uh, we just only focus a few fields. We can uh, share our experience in the later. Uh, this is a uh, uh, AIoT platform. Uh, we have a slogan. Uh, the platform uh, built in the, our cloud. The second, uh, the we, we, we have two interface. Uh, we can uh, we, we, we separate the two interfaces, northbound uh, interface and the southbound interface. They can connect to device and uh, uh, service. And uh, we, three, uh, we have three codes. We have t uh, two characteristic uh, 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 characteristic in here. One is a, a CMP we call the Connectivity Management Platform. So we provide this, uh, this function for our uh, customers. They can manage, manage uh, their, their connection by himself. And uh, we, can, uh, we also provide a telephone application service. It's a mean we, if uh, some events uh, occur, we can uh, make a phone call to the home. Uh, for example, if a garbage can uh, uh, will come to our home, we can make a phone call to to info you, you can take the garbage uh, outside the, uh, the 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 street uh, to to spread to the garbage can. Uh, this is southbound interface. We uh, we implement the, the software according to the uh, standard, so we uh, can accommodate a lot of the device. Uh, for example, for uh, the smart manufacturer, we according to the more bus or OPC server, they can compatible with 90% uh, machine tool. The surveillance we can, we follow it on beef protocol, we can uh, accommodate uh, about 500 kind of uh, IP cap. The northbound interface, we provide the tool for uh, a web page process mobile APP. They are 131 API for call domain and the intelligence module. Uh, Zhonghua Telecom IoT platform launched in the two year 2008. It's a free for newcomers. Uh, in the future, we will charge by the by tri traffic. Uh, there are some characteristic. Fast connection, measurement network connection, data security, and uh, uh, smart cloud. Uh, if anyone interested in this platform can contact us. Uh, here we show the IoT application. I think uh, we just released some of applications, but the long, uh, time uh, limitation, so we can talk about IATS, intelligent traffic uh, system, and uh, smart city. Uh, the, here we show the smart railway IoT plan. Uh, you know, I, uh, our government have a policy. Uh, they 
needed to localization uh, our solution. So we plan uh, IoT for railway. Uh, they include the train, uh, track side, and the uh, uh, station. All this information collected from the button line of the uh, uh, list, some uh, track uh, pantograph temperature in the carriage. Uh, here we show the train monitoring system. Uh, if if uh, we uh, uh, collect the uh, information from the train, we can uh, show uh, the real-time train location in the map. We also can show the train X temperature. If the temperature abnormal, we can uh, alarm uh, to manage. And also we can show the uh, quality of uh, carriage. Uh, <coughs> The second, we also deploy the surveillance system in the carriage so we can uh, an analyze the car level. Uh, we show the different color in the button line. So they are a carriage. Uh, we can show different uh, car level. If this information is uh, provided to the platform on the train station, so passenger can choose the comfortable carriage they can take. Uh, the second, we enter to connect the car. There are four scenarios for the connected car. Uh, first one is a vehicle to the network. The second, uh, to vehicle to infrastructure. Uh, and the V2V is a vehicle to vehicle. And the V2P is a vehicle to pen the stretch. The uh, top two, V2N and the V2I, we already uh, done in the new project. Uh, this is uh, show the V2N architecture. We joined the first uh, national level autonomous vehicle plan in Taiwan. We verify the multi field, which include the Taoyuan, Taichung, and the Tainan. And uh, we verify the uh, multi type vehicle. Uh, which include the SVU, SUV, and the bus, and the sedan. And uh, we, we collect the uh, operation uh, and the testing uh, data. Uh, we can show the, such as the outside image of the car and the uh, uh, location and uh, some uh, permit showing the dashboard. Because small, I cannot uh, read. Uh, the second uh, case, we deploy the long-term uh, operation public transportation in the uh, new Taipei city. Uh, between from the uh, Kandin uh, Lai uh, Railway uh, Station to the Marawai New uh, Square, uh, the distance about uh, 900 uh, meter. <laughs> This is a long-term operation. Uh, in the middle of uh, the, the, uh, the, this, this distance, we have a traffic light. Uh, we install the low side unit, RSU, which can collect the traffic information, uh, such as uh, the, the number of uh, 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 traffic volume or penetration or some uh, uh, traffic light parameter. Uh, this parameter transfer to the uh, uh, autonomy uh, vehicle or the uh, control center. They can increase the uh, safety of the operation. Uh, the second, I will talk about the traffic big data. Uh, you know, uh, the, we have uh, over the 11 million uh, subscriber, mobile subscribers in the Taiwan. The marketing share is about the 37 percentage uh, in Taiwan, traffic uh, information the coverage is only about twenty-five uh, percent. The correction sensor is a VD. We call the VD vehicle detector. It's a coil uh, buried uh, underground. When the, uh, the when the vehicle pass by, they can uh, take some uh, information from there. But uh, uh, the maintenance fee very high, so we're looking for the another solution. So we take the CVP. So CVP is we can collect uh, the information from the mobile networking and uh, analyze uh, this uh, 
uh, information and the estimated the travel time uh, for the traffic control center and uh, uh, public. Uh, even we can do another value edit. Uh, this is uh, show the uh, our achievement in the road number nine in the east uh, coast of Taiwan. We, uh, if you drive along the Yilan to the Hualien, if you approach uh, the uh, uh, Taiduge National uh, uh, Park, you can uh, receive the how many people uh, we estimate in the, that, uh, that national park. So you can decide, decide to uh, enter this uh, park or, or not. Uh, the second, we can analysis the uh, OD uh, data. The OD stands for the origination and the destination. So this is example in the uh, Chaotian uh, temple, uh, which located in the Yunlin. So we, uh, every, every year, they have a party or a holding there. So we can show the, uh, a lot of performers uh, in the right hand side of this chart. Uh, the performers uh, tend to red, it means uh, the traffic cloud. So if you want to go to there, you can choose an alternative route. Uh, that can save your, uh, your, your travel time. The last uh, we, I will mention about smart city of Zhonghua Telecom. Uh, we have already developed uh, the IOC, Intelligent Operation Center, by ourselves. There are three major functions. Uh, the first function is uh, operation and the monitoring function, is, which is like a, a dashboard. Uh, the second, uh, we can analyze the recollection data and uh, uh, take uh, valuable information to uh, the manner or the uh, uh, <coughs> both to make the decision. The last, uh, we can uh, support uh, the uh, uh, decision, uh, the, the smart government, uh, is, which means uh, we can cooperate uh, with different uh, uh, department. Uh, for example, if a traffic accident may be relative to the two department, one is a policeman, another is a, a traffic department. They can, uh, they can do that, uh, they can handle that uh, accident uh, according to the SOP. So we can use this uh, IOC, uh, finish that. Uh, here we uh, <coughs> launch in a different area and a different city, the Taoyuan city, Taichung city, and uh, Kaohsiung, Hamasin uh, is a, a, street light, a street light, and the industry, in the Hefa Industry Park. Uh, this is an example of the Taoyuan city. We provide uh, cross domain data analysis on the food security, fire prevention, traffic accident, and uh, low construction. Uh, the top of the uh, slides, we show the food manufacturer analysis. In Taoyuan City, there are about 100 food manufacturer uh, factory, uh, only about five to six uh, inspectors uh, in the public sector. So how to choice, how to schedule it to check the security of the food. We can collect parameters uh, like the temperature, like the historic uh, record, we can predict the high risk factory and the <coughs> suggest for the public sector to take the check. Uh, the button uh, of the, this uh, slice, we have a low construction analysis. We can predict what time do the uh, low construction, uh, the complaint is, uh, is low. So we, uh, we, we provide these uh, two functions for the Taoyuan city. Uh, the last example is a real-time cloud analysis. You know, last year, uh, New Year event party uh, in the Taoyuan. Uh, the party will begin and, uh, in the 1910. From the information, we can predict uh, the uh, 17 the people uh, visit to there. And uh, we can show the right hand side, we can show the, the, uh, the moving in and the move out uh, uh, <coughs> passenger. 
And so we can uh, take this information for uh, city government to plan, to plan the tropical control when we're stuck. The temperature, uh, temporary parking area in which where the shuttle bus, how to arrange, uh, is, uh, can uh, take the passenger in and out. So this information is uh, very valuable for uh, the, the Taoyuan city government. So the last we talk about, uh, we make a conclusion. We talk about a lot of the IoT example and we build an IoT platform. So we welcome our partner uh, can cooperate with us. We can make the big uh, opportunity and the business uh, in IoT. That's all my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Law. I think as a broadband service provider, it is very important and a very uh, big movement from only a pure infrastructure service provider uh, to the um, application service provider via collaboration with different uh, vertical industries and uh, especially with the uh, innovative entrepreneur or uh, other innovations. Maybe we can uh, talk about more about the uh, exciting applications later in the panel discussion. Okay, let's move to the uh, fourth, uh, our fourth speakers. Uh, the fourth speaker is uh, Ms. Joy Chen, uh, Senior Director, Far Eastern. Ms. Chen is leading the uh, planning and development team focusing on new technologies such as IoT, AI, and big data. With her cross-industry and cross-functional experience and solid capability in strategic planning, business development, product planning, and development, Joyce endeavors to generate value via business and technology integration. Let's welcome Joyce. Good afternoon, all the online audience. I'm Joyce Chen from Far East Tone Telecommunications, FET. Thank you for the opportunity today. Today, I'm going to focus on the how FET transform with these new technologies, especially AI and AIoT. First of all, let's have a good, let's have a quick glance at FET. FET is a mobile telecommunication company based in Taiwan for over 20 years. We have mobile subscribers over 7 million users, and we have over 5 uh, half million of enterprise customers. Our yearly revenue is close to 3 billion in US dollar, and our market value is close to 9 billion in US dollar. As a telecommunication company, we not only offer fixed line and mobile communications, we also offer digital services to our customers and also integrated solutions to government and enterprise customers. In recent years, we set a clear goal that we want to transform ourselves from Telecom to Telecom Plus. What do we mean by Telecom Plus? We will leverage these new technologies, including 5G, Big Data, IoT, AI, security, and cloud, to create and develop more digital services and products to our consumer customers, and also will integrate end-to-end -end solutions to our enterprises. So what have we done and what's our approach on AI and AIoT? Here are four highlights to share. First one, we transform ourselves in, AI, in IoT. We move up the value chain Nowadays, we are not just only a telecom uh, teleconnection providers. We build our own platforms and also we develop applications on our own and also with our partners. Here is the total portfolio of our IoT offering in the market. So on network, we have NB IoT, we have 4G and 5G is coming. Platform level, we have SIM connection management platform and also we delivered an IoT platform called CAT, Connect All Things, which enables all kinds of applications on top of it. And we also deliver quite some applications in the market already for city governments, for enterprise customers, and for consumers. 
So we move all the way from network providers to total solution provider. Second highlight, with all the IoT enabled, we start to develop AIoT solutions. With all the data and information collected, let's take energy management as an example. Now we can monitor all the energy consumption in very real time. With all the data available, we start to consider if it's possible that we can set all the parameters of machines to automatically adjust the temperature so that we can reduce the power consumption. So later on, I'm going to share with you this case. Third highlight, we are not doing AI just for the sake of AI. We would like to generate revenue and prove the existence of revenue uh, value. Therefore, we start from our internal use cases first. Later, I'm going to show you some use cases which are focusing on our own internal demands. With all the value and, uh, and concept proved, we now start to package these solutions and bring that to our customers in order to generate value and help them transform. Importantly, it's a co-creation process. We need to enhance our own capabilities and also we leverage with our ecosystem partners' capabilities. Uh, more about two years ago, we set up a technology center which is called Transformation Office. Therefore, we bring all these IoT application platform and also these uh, big data insight and AI solutions. And it's not just uh, by our own self. We also jointly developed with some uh, startup partners and also some industry leading partners. Now, back to today's focus. I'm going to share with you the five AIoT cases today. First one is energy management. Second one is safety and security. Third one is smart street light. Fourth one is about fabric or quality control. The last one is drainage system. Let me introduce you the case one by one. First one is our internal use case. Firestone, we got several office buildings and also IDC centers. So we got very professional and experienced colleagues who manage all the investment and monitor all the energy consumption in past 10, 20 years. Last year, we come up with the idea that given that we have all the data and information available and energy consumption reduction is our critical target for all year long, how about we build up a model to optimize energy consumption by adjusting the parameters of these machines based on environmental variables. So in summary, here are the buildings. There are a lot of machines, HVAC machines. So what we are trying to do is that we collect all the temperature and humidity data, and then we try to adjust the parameters of these machines. Later on, we train a model. We, we, we expect these machines will adjust by themselves. And our objective is to deliver the environmental comfort for IDC machines and for the people in the office space. And ultimate goal is to save the energy consumption. So what we have done is that uh, we built uh, with all the data available, we uh, collect all the data for past one year. And then we built a AI model. Here are three types of data. First type in red, which are envir environmental data, including the temperature, humidity, the uh, temperature of cooling water, and also uh, the chill water flow. Purple one is the parameters, which we can set, set up manually or by machine automatically. For example, the chilled water pump frequency or the chilled water temperature. Green one, importantly, is what we want to measure, including the temperature and also the power consumption. After a couple months, together with technical team and our professional uh, people in energy management, here comes out the result. On top of this chart, you can show, uh, here shows all the um, indicators of these parameters. The right hand side is the um, SCADA system, which is a central controlling system. We build our machine, uh, machine learning models and integrate it into the SCADA 
system. On the top hand, on the top, top side, you can see the two charts. Its comparison, the green line shows the actual power consumption, and the black one shows the power consumption after recommendation. So here we see the positive result, and then we started to share our know-how and also our energy management solution to our customers who wish to reduce their energy consumption. Second case, AI in safety and security. This also comes from our internal demands. And we have got two cases to share here. Both are computer vision or facial recognition technology being adopted. What we want to achieve is that to enhance the operation efficiency and security for visitor control or for entrance control. So the whole system is now in operation in our office. So if there is a visitor coming, our employees will register the uh, visitor information and a schedule in a mobile app first. So when visitor arrives in a, at a reception, there, uh, his photo will be taken, and then he will be authorized to enter into our office building automatically. So by doing so, we reduce the manpower at reception, and we increase the security. For pricey concern, all the photos will be deleted at the end of the day. Another use case is in IDC and also our lab. There needs stricter uh, safety control in IDC and lab. Similarly, we apply the uh, facial recognition technology in a lab and IDC access right. And except for the verification, whether it's our engineers, or whether it's vendors engineers who can access at the right time. We add something more. We monitor which area they can access to. So if they access to the area not, they are not supposed to get entered into, then there will be a lamp sent to the monitoring center. Third IoT, AIoT use case is the smart street light. Last year, we won the biggest smart street light contract in Taoyuan County. On this project, we provide one, the controller hardware, secondly, the uh, connection network, and third one is the management platform. So by mid of this year, 88,000 of street light will be converted or be replaced to become smart, which can be remotely monitored and controlled. In this case, we also developed two interesting AI models. First one is about predictive maintenance and auto healing. On this contract, we have the obligation to offer 15 years of operation and maintenance. So how to ensure the maintenance efficiency is very critical. For example, once the controller is damaged or broken, we need to fix it right away. So it in involves two kinds of costs. One is the device cost, and another one is a labor cost. So we try to build a model to predict which device might be damaged soon. Also, the damage can come from two areas. One is the network connection problem, and the other one is the device problem. So uh, we developed these uh, AI models to have some early detection. Because the street light sends signal through base station, through core network to our management system, so we collect all the data available. And we build an AI machine model. We predict which device might be needs malfunctioning soon. And then we, took, we take two actions. One is we auto-reconnect to ensure the connection works proper, properly. And if the connection doesn't come back, which means the device is already broken, and then we send workers to get it repaired or replaced. Another interesting case on smart street light is that the smart street light used a lot of powers at night time, and it was on all the time with the same brightness. But now we are able to control it remotely so we consider whether we can further reduce the energy consumption. So this is an interesting experiment and still an ongoing project. We, collect, we consider three factors. One is the brightness, which is the illumination. 
Second one is the traffic. Depends on the, tra the people or the uh, car traffic on the spot. Third one, we consider the weather condition. So on sunny day or on rainy day, the brightness can be different. So by combining all these factors, we build a simulation model, and then we adjust the brightness depending on the environment status. And the goal is to save more energies. The fourth use case is in quality detection. This is also a computer vision use cases. We apply it in a textile manufacturer. We collaborate with these manufacturers in Southeast Asia as a first pilot site. And this manufacturer also belongs to Far Eastern Group. Nowadays, they use uh, human workers to detect the fabric defect. And through this project, we collaborate with them. The objective is to reduce manpower, to stabilize quality, and to increase the productivity with the whole AIoT solutions. So first, we need to collect the data. So we set up AOI with the camera machines at the very beginning of the production line. And second step, we collect all the pictures with all the experienced workers who, who can help identify what what kind of defect it is. So we use this to train models. And then later on, we deploy this model locally in a server machine. Combine all this together, this manufacturer site, they enabled a AOI, AOIT, and all together with all the uh, production lines afterwards to become an automatic industry 4.0 case. The fifth case I would like to share is the drainage system. This is also a real case in Taoyuan City. And this case got Smart City Award last year. Taoyuan City plans to build a flood monitoring system for the 700 kilometers long drainage system. So along the 700 kilometers long, they set up several things. First one, they, they place over 143 rainfall and water monitors. And also there are some quality sensors to, to check out the uh, water quality. And along the way, there are also camera sensors set up, which monitors the water level and the possible of flood situation. With all the solution combined all together, IoT and, and AIoT, the drainage monitoring is now well controlled. So people can get, get alert, can monitor the water level and water quality at very real time. So here is just some of the AIoT cases that we just shared. And of course, there are more AIoT solutions to come. And 5G is about to be launched. We are ready. And we welcome more partners to join us for co-creation and bring value to the valuable solutions to the market. Thank you. And also, I hope everyone stays safe and stay healthy and hope that we can meet in person sometime soon in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, Within this section, I think most of the uh, speakers, uh, they come from our uh, infrastructure provider, uh, either uh, in the city government or the uh, mobile operators. And uh, um, I think the reason why we cannot uh, meet in person and uh, we need to uh, uh, use the online program to meet our audience is that uh, right now we are under the uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19. So I think uh, we have learned a uh, lot from the reports uh, uh, that uh, um, I think under the COVID-19, this kind of uh, special emergency, uh, the infrastructure uh, is uh, has become the I think lifeline or, or the, the most important lifeline lifeline uh, of our uh, uh, social life and our economic uh, situation. So I think uh, uh, right now we are moved to the uh, short panel discussion. So uh, the first question uh, I would like to raise is that as a provider of ICT infrastructure for industry and citizen. Uh, what is the challenges and opportunities in the pandemic of uh, COVID-19? Do you have any current effort, uh, plan, or proposal, or even achievement to share with us? I think, uh, Alan? Okay. Thank you, Chairman. 
I think as a telecom operator, the biggest challenge is the all sales. Because can you image the one telecom company uh, was affected by the virus, they will shut down their operation. What happened is it? Maybe the whole city will shut down and impact country operation. So first the important thing, we should protect ourselves first. So we already implement the very strict the plan to make sure all operation is uh, stable and uh, non attack by the uh, COVID-19. The second thing is to help myself and uh, help customer then. So the customer also asked us to expand their bandwidth in this moment to help them build up their teleconference system. So most of the customer, enterprise customer, uh, do not have such kind of experience to work at different location to continue uh, letting their company running again. So this is very important moment. We would like to support them. The second thing is help them to implement the enterprise instant message. We have product called the M Plus, can easily to use and safety easy tell the difference from the uh, private message and uh, the, the government and the business message. The third one is uh, we should help customers to improve their mobilization capability. They have this capability to keep the continuity operation from the from the, 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 the business operation is very important. So this one I have shared the my opinion. Yeah, I think uh, the uh, <clears throat> Ellen mentioned about uh, the first point, uh, I think it's kind of a BCP, right? It's a business continuity plan, planning. So I think every enterprise, even the government, they, uh, we need the uh, we need the BCP and uh, especially the uh, uh, broadband service provider uh, uh, is the uh, most important infrastructure and yes. the need to protect uh, yourselves and uh, uh, provide services uh, continuously uh, to yes. the, uh, uh, the whole society. Yeah, That's great. Okay. Then I think uh, Dr. Lo? Yes. I think uh, the disease, uh, pandemic disease prevention is an application of everyone. Uh, Zhonghua Telecom have uh, some uh, strategy uh, to prevention here. And also we uh, help the government uh, development uh, or set up uh, uh, the system. The system uh, function include uh, we can uh, detect uh, the, the stay home uh, people uh, uh, go to the uh, outside and uh, send the alarm message to uh, monitor the uh, people. Uh, we, we collect uh, the, the base station location uh, uh, signal strength and uh, uh, antenna direction, so we can uh, analyze this uh, parameter and estimate. Uh, in order to improve the position uh, accurately, that we uh, cooperate with the AI lab and uh, collect the GPS location and uh, assist uh, predict uh, accurately. Uh, the second, we uh, cooperate with the uh, wearable device company, uh, they, which can detect the uh, skin temperature and uh, send this uh, data to the back end. Uh, uh, we, 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 we send it to the AI predict module, which are a cooperation with the university and the hospital. They can predict uh, the people have a fever or not in the future. The last, uh, uh, as I mentioned before in my talk, uh, we can detect the cloud in the uh, hot spot. Uh, there are maybe a uh, hundred uh, or, or thousand uh, hot spot, uh, such as a uh, night market or, or Canadian National Park. Many people, many many to, uh, many, many visitors uh, uh, go to there. Maybe uh, will increase the uh, risk of the uh, pandemic uh, infection. So we can use the big data predict uh, how many people inside a hotspot area. We use the different color, a red color, yellow color, and the green color uh, show in the APP. Uh, the APP we uh, 
a, a combine into the uh, I nine six A. It's a, a, a highway bureau uh, app. So maybe in the future we we'll announce this app for public. So that's all my answer. Okay, thank you, uh, Director Law. Uh, uh, it's re it reminds me that uh, the, the the hottest to Hotics topics um, these two days, uh, they are two different messenger uh, from operators, right? Uh, one is the PWS, the other one is uh, cellular phone uh, base station base uh, message. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's move to, yeah, Joyce. Yes. Okay, so uh, facing the challenge from COVID-19, I think it brings impact to consumers, enterprise, and also government. And of course, five tone um, take actions toward for these three entities. So for consumers, they travel less. So um, our uh, roaming revenue is of course reduced. However, people stay home longer, so uh, they need more entertainment services, and also they need to work from home. So uh, five tone offers all these uh, online shopping and online video service for trial or even for free for people to enjoy and to share. And also we facilitate, we ensure that there is sufficient coverage and bandwidth for people to work from home. For enterprise, critical thing is that given that employees need to work, with, uh, work from home, there are four kinds of demands. First one is the network infrastructure. Second one is the web hosting. The third one is security. The fourth one is the online or te uh, telephone conferencing. So uh, Firestone has package all these solutions and provide to our either big customers, enter, uh, enterprise customers or small and medium business and we receive very positive feedback. Last one is a government, uh, similar to Chongha Telecom. So we support NCC and government with all the information and support required for current quarantine program. Yeah. So that's what we have done so far. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for sharing. I think um, Let's pull back to the uh, main theme of the uh, web conference uh, 2020. Uh, if we uh, look back to uh, the 30 years ago, I think when the triple W has been invented, nobody can predict uh, after 30 years, uh, web and uh, mobile devices has become everyone's daily life. Uh, we cannot live alone without them. And right now, and in the near future, I think before the, I think the, before the end of this year, maybe uh, the third quarter, right? Uh, we have 5G, AI, and IoT in our everyday lives. I think um, according, you, uh, according to the uh, sharing and the presentation speak, uh, speech uh, of our speakers, uh, I'm quite happy to know that uh, our uh, uh, broadband service provider uh, has already moved to the uh, 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 future service provider. Uh, you collaborate with uh, different vertical uh, industries and uh, make uh, many uh, innovations uh, to provide uh, uh, the uh, application. So I think the topic is not only limited to the uh, infrastructure. Uh, I think uh, discuss about the application is more excited. So that uh, my second question is that, um, can you share with us that uh, uh, what is the biggest impact for industry and the citizen? Once we have 5G plus AIoT infrastructure ready, what is the most exciting applications from your perspective? Yes. Okay. Oh, or from, from, from my <laughs> Anyone <perspective>, else? <laughs> no problem. Okay. From my perspective, the, in case the AIoT and 5G ready, I think for my opinion, the most exciting application is smart home. Uh, I am a lady person. When I work for a whole day back to home, I want to enjoy a very high quality AR VR movie and also have some a very comfortable environment uh, in the living room. If you, in case you don't worry about the, what time the, your refrigerator is empty, you know, in case you are walking, uh, uh, watching a very high, exciting quality AR VR movie. When your wife calls you, asks you to go outside, buy a dozen of the egg, what happened is this. In case this IoT is ready, so you don't worry about this, all of the things can fit up in your refrigerator already through the, 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 the smart home application. The second thing is that you never worry about what time your car needs to maintain. Don't worry about what time the car will out of order on the road. The IoT and the application service will automatically send people to drive your car to maintain. 
to avoid any things of the um, predictable things here. So smart home is my uh, exciting application in the near future I would like to see. Yes. That's great. And that is what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Director Lo. Uh, as you know, Zhonghua Telecom uh, had uh, spent a lot of money to win the bandwidth. Uh, we worry about what things we can right? do. 5G, Yeah, in 5G. So I, I'm in charge of the IoT product in my company. We, they are a, 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 four, plus, a four plus two. Uh, I think the most potential, I think they are two. The first is uh, ITS, so Intelligent Transportation System. Uh, in Taiwan, they are by a nine category in the ITS, but uh, uh, the business opportunity, I think uh, we focus on three. Uh, the first one uh, is, uh, as I mentioned, the railway IoT. The second one is a kinetic car. Uh, the, the third uh, is a, a tropical management. So most of the budget from the government. The second, I think, uh, the most uh, 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 a big opportunity is a surveillance. So many uh, site uh, surveillance uh, we we interest in. Uh, the biggest opportunity, I think, uh, in the policeman department. So uh, maybe uh, in the 5G IoT, I uh, first uh, I were extended the current uh, the exist. Uh, ICT service to the 5G. The next, we will find a new area, new domain. Uh, for example, healthcare. We can cooperation with the uh, uh, smart glasses company. We can uh, we can do the tele telemedicine uh, in the uh, remote remote site or the uh, 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 suburban site. We. Uh, we, 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 we cooperation with the public uh, health center and the hospital. They can cooperation each other to, uh, to diagnose the patient uh, in the remote site. Uh, and uh, another new domain we, 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 uh, we, we, we need to plan. Uh, currently, we collection uh, 15 items inside my company, so we would we, 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 we need, if we report and uh, visit to our customers, uh, and uh, we want to try, want to try take back response. So in the uh, Q3, maybe uh, July in this year, we will launch the 5G. Maybe some important uh, uh, service, uh, for example, a virtual private network for for the uh, big enterprise. Maybe the first uh, uh, product in here. Thank you. Okay, thank Director Lo. Um, I think we can see many uh, different applications. Uh, yeah, but uh, at the same time, I think uh, the uh, uh, many uh, legal compliance uh, is very important, including the data protection, privacy, and as you mentioned about the surveillance. I think, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the from the uh, in the very beginning, that uh, the data is the driven force. So I think uh, we can. Um, uh, not, we, we, we see data not only from the, uh, the uh, pure legal side, but we need to, uh, to, to make the, the, the compliance usage. Uh, we see the positive uh, uh, usage of our data, then we can uh, go af forward to the uh, data economy, right? So, man, Joyce. Sure, okay, yeah. Uh, 5G impact, similarly, it brings impact to consumer enterprise and also government. Uh, with the consumers, I think um, Ms. Leo has already shared some information. And similar here in uh, Firestone, we are going to bring some new entertainment services uh, to our customers, especially on VR, video, and also some cloud gaming. Okay, so uh, for example, in the future, people can enjoy all the um, concert in multiple view and at home. Yeah, so I think uh, we are just, uh, it's just under development and under creation. So uh, we are you can expect that in the coming soon, coming future. And for enterprise, I would like to emphasize two areas. First one is about healthcare. Recently, we just enabled a re remote diagnosis solution for rural areas. It's for uh, patients in the rural area and also for the doctors in the rural area to connect with the doctors in the big 
hospitals in the city region. Yep. So through the remote diagnosis, those patients or those doctors, they can detect those uh, patients' status in real time, especially in some rural areas. The, the uh, fixed network coverage is probably not sufficient. So 5G would be a good network to, uh, to provide it, uh, to fulfill this demand. And another thing is about a 5G private network. Because there are a lot of leading uh, high-tech manufacturers here in Taiwan, they are going to enable all kinds of IoT or AIoT applications. So uh, they decide to have their own private network. So uh, we provide not only public uh, 5G network, but we supply from all the equipment to the operation and maintenance service to these high-tech manuf manufacturers. Yep. Uh, to government, I think we share a similar view with Chunghua Telecom uh, regarding the transportation or ITS. Like uh, Taipei City, they have started to trial the uh, autonomous bus. This is also one of the uh, focus areas that we have been working on. And the other thing is about the transportation safety. So surveillance-wise, I think we, we more focus on the safe safety factors instead of uh, pure monitoring. Yeah. So uh, there will be more and more uh, 5G solution uh, under development, and so I think uh, people uh, will be able to see some exciting service pretty soon. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so uh, be, uh, due to the uh, limited time, I think uh, within the section of uh, AIT, the first section of uh, AIT track, we have learned uh, uh, from our speakers uh, from the uh, uh, web and uh, pure uh, infrastructure to the uh, different layers, including the uh, different uh, applications uh, uh, to our uh, social uh, uh, social e uh, events and our enterprise uh, industry uh, events and uh, even the government administration. Uh, I think we can say that uh, uh, all of us, the whole society, is under the uh, digital transformation journey. I think we are on the journey and uh, the uh, pandemic uh, of uh, COVID-19 will speedy, will speedy the uh, digital transformation of our journey. Uh, so uh, I think um, uh, we would like to say that uh, I think uh, we are looking forward to future uh, development and uh, future uh, 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 about the uh, different excited uh, application and uh, 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 above the uh, trusted uh, infrastructure uh, of our uh, operators provided. So uh, I think uh, thank, thank you again for our speakers sharing, sharing your experience and your, uh, your uh, cases to us. And thank, thank you to our um, online audience to join us. Thank you. Thank you again. Good afternoon, our online audience and everyone. Welcome to come back to the, A, uh, <coughs> the AIoT track of the Web Conference 2020. We are now in Taipei, and thank you for joining us uh, from the, uh, from the uh, Zoom or the uh, YouTube. Okay, so uh, now we are going to the uh, second part, second section of the AIoT track. Uh, in the first track, uh, we are focusing on the um, <coughs> the infrastructure, including the web and the, uh, the infrastructure from city government and the uh, mobile operators uh, point of view. And uh, right now we are going to the second part of the AIoT track. Uh, the same, we have uh, uh, four distinguished uh, speakers uh, uh, from Taiwan and uh, other uh, site. Uh, First, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the first uh, speaker is the uh, Ted Zhang, CTO, Quanta Computer Inc. Say hello Thank to you. our audience. Hi, Say a everybody. few words. Uh, this is Ted Chen from the Quanta Computer. Um, uh, it's my great honor and pre uh, special privilege to be here to speak something about what we are going to do uh, with AOIT and telemedicine. Okay. Yeah, okay. And the second speaker is uh, Tao Ling, a CTO. Aegis Technology Inc. Uh, my name is Ta. So uh, today I'm going to uh, discuss, share some of the uh, user interface stuff to everybody. Okay. 
there are two more speakers. Uh, uh, they are online uh, right now. Later, I will introduce them to you. So the second part of our uh, AIoT track, uh, uh, we will focus on the main theme uh, concerning about the AI and the computer vision in the new web era. Uh, because of uh, the uh, background of our uh, distinguished uh, speakers, I think uh, they will provide uh, their insights and uh, share their experience and uh, their project and uh, their company's business to all of you. So uh, the first speaker, I would like to uh, introduce the Ted Zhang, uh, the CTO of Quanta Computer Inc. And his topic is AIoT for Future Medicine. Uh, Dr. Ted Zhang is the Chief Technology Officer, CTO, Vice President, and General Manager of Quanta Computer, known as the world's biggest ODM and uh, laptop computer maker. Along with his role as CTO, he oversees corporate technology strategy and global research partnership. Dr. Zhang uh, is um, uh, research interested. Uh, right now focuses on human-centric innovation for smarter lifestyle through AIoT. Um, that uh, integrate IoT, cloud computing, big data analysis, and machine learning. He is dedicated to create a sustainable model so that great ideas in research lab can turn into great social impacts through product and business innovation. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Zhang. Thank you, Nicole. Um, it's my, uh, really my great pleasure to be here. And so my topic is very simple. I simply try to uh, uh, let uh, uh, people understand what we are doing the, the, from ICT industry. Uh, so my topic is simply the AIoT uh, for future medicine. So AIoT it stands for the platform or technology that uh, uh, we are building. And also the uh, future medicine is the application domain. So before I started with everything, I would like to uh, introduce our company to you. It's not a so a famous company uh, to you all, but we are making you know, the, uh, uh, many the things that the people might get used to use every day. And so this is um, an interview from the BBC, and basic, basically they, they uh, announced to the public that uh, Quanta is the biggest laptop maker on this planet. But basically, we are not just making laptop. We are making many things, you know, more than just laptop. And so, uh, when I uh, joined Quanta in year 2000, and uh, I received uh, the first idea, the first drawing uh, from Steve Jobs, uh, passed by uh, our founder chairman. He said, "What is this? Because you know, Quanta Computer is a computer company, so this should be a computer." And later, we turned it into an iMac. And a few years later, uh, we received another request from Google that they are going to have a new operating system called, so, called Chrome. They need a laptop optimized for Chrome OS, and we make something happen again. And in year, uh, about 15 years ago, then uh, 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 Professor Nigel Pontet, founder of uh, Media Lab, MIT, he came to us and said that uh, we need to support the education of the third world. We need a very low cost uh, laptop to support the education. And we need new technology as innovations. We need uh, 100 laptop uh, projects. And so we make something happen, it later called uh, One Laptop Per Child Project. And so after we make the announcement, uh, we think uh, six months we kick off the first uh, uh, prototype, we ship it to Africa. And so that's uh, something that we do every day. We are not just uh, receive the, uh, you know, the detailed order or the design from our uh, partners. We actually design uh, with them and collaborate with them to make something happen to solve the real problems. And of course, later, you know, that uh, uh, very famous um, um, Apple, they want to make a very a beautiful watch, integrated all, all kinds of sensors and actuators and a very small device, we make it happen again. And uh, in year 2006 or so, we actually worked with MIT on their first autonomous car uh, for the DAPA Grand Challenge. And we put a server on this car, and at the time, it's a braid server, so we have 10 braids. Each braid has two cores. So 
actually on this, you know, the autonomous car, it equipped uh, 40 cores on the same, you know, platforms. And so that's a, that's a reason why we enter into uh, the autonomous car or, you know, the market. And of course, you know, people need just, not just on, on the client devices, they need more server. They need to provide, you know, computing as a service. So we quantize also the biggest uh, server providers for, for the cloud service provider uh, globally. Uh, companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, they all have our, our quantum server. And of course, we also make uh, software, not just hardware. So quantize is simply the company making ideas happen. And you can see that uh, it's a company funded back in the year 1988, and every 10 years, we have a vision for the future. So you can see that uh, Quanta is number one on the laptop manufacturing, and also on the server for the cloud computing, and also providing you know huge amount of GPU server to power up the uh, AI. And also that uh, you know people are talking about 5G, and the major impact of 5G is about how to cloudify the central office into a new cloud for communications. So basically, since Quanta is the number one in cloud computing, we also move into the, the 5G very smoothly. So this is uh, how we transform ourselves for the past 32 years. So basically, we view us as a new startups because um, um, every year, every five years, we have new technologies and that kind of technology needs new paradigm shifts and we need innovation in the order to survive in the market. So we are just like a 32 years old uh, startup and uh, we are lucky to survive, uh, you know, currently. And so it's also a Fortune 500 uh, uh, companies and so we uh, do all the R&D in Taiwan. We have over the, actually over 6,000 R&D engineers in Taiwan we do the uh, 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 manufacturing men in China. We do global supply chain management. So basically, the tech uh, 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 Taiwan's uh, new supercomputer site, uh, Taiwan uh, Two, for example, is all the architect and uh, and also design and also the provided by by quantum computer. It is the world's number uh, 20s most powerful supercomputer. And of course, you, you can see that in addition to the uh, uh, traditional uh, computer and servers, we also try to make more the medical the sensors and uh, to support different kind of telemedicine. We also provide uh, you know, full solutions for smart world and smart hospital. And uh, we also provide AI together with some you know, uh, big data analytics to support precision medicine. So we simply the company making tools uh, for uh, for AI, and we are you know looking forward to collaborate with you know all kind of partners uh, globally. And so uh, you know because our our uh, our innovations in the past, uh, we are recognized by the the WEN as the top 100 global in innovators for the for two years. And we have long-term, very long-term rela research relationship with, uh, with MIT since year 2004. The first project is called Tea Party because we try to throw the traditional uh, desktop to the Boston Harbor and create another technology the, you know, uh, revolution. So we call it Tea Party. And later we, uh, we choose Cumulus because we move our research uh, projects into the cloud computings. And last year, we just initiated another new project uh, with very focus on computational healthcare. So we try to integrate everything what we do before uh, with more focus on the medicine and also healthcare. So you can see that uh, Quanta is a company that provides innovation design manufacturing as a service, not only manufacturing, just manufacturing. We have our own research, we have our own design teams. We simply try to uh, solve the real world problem with our partners, and that's Quanta. And so the problems that we try to, uh, to solve today is that we try to make the, you know, uh, the future medicine or medical care or healthcare even more smarter based on the AI technology. And I will explain uh, you know, uh, something that we are doing right now. 
But you know, when we receive this assignment, the most important thing for us is that we have to understand the patient. It's not to understand what we have right now. We have to understand what are the real world you know, problems. So two years ago, the most you know, the important and famous patient passed away in year 2018. And he, uh, he left a chair. And if you take a you know, deep look of the chair, you can understand you know, what our engineers are working every day. And because we're working every day to solve some problems. For example, you know, Steve Hawking, when he cannot walk, we have to design the autonomous you know, uh, um, car you know, for, for him. And also that, you know, the, when he cannot uh, speak, you know, then we need uh, you know, th you know, the, a voice synthesizer for that. He can use his uh, three fingers to, um, to control the car. That is one thing. But later on, he can only has one finger to control the car. That is another thing. And later, he is very difficult to even move his finger. Then the problem happens. What can he, you know, control, uh, you know, or you know, keep publishing what's inside his mind to the, uh, you know, to the public is another issue. So you can see that, uh, you know, maybe study from ten years ago, uh, there is a small, uh, you know, sensors under beneath his glass. It detects the motions of the muscles, you know, be, in, you know, on his face. When he tried to, uh, you know, the, to do double click, he simply move, he move the muscles. Uh, but you know, as as times go by, he cannot even move the muscle. And then people try to think about eyeball tracking. People think about, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, mind control. But this kind of technology is too complicated for, you know, a genius like uh, uh, um, Stephen Hawking because their minds is always jumping. And so people uh, think about you know how to use big data analytics, taking all his old pub, you know publishment and analyze it and come up with a smart input, and that's something that uh, you know you can see how you know the technology evolve to them you know help people, and these are all the te technology you know the, that we need today not only for you know the health people or for only for the young, but it's a technology for our own future. Uh, you know, uh, for the uh, you, you know, when we are getting old, we all need this because we are unable to do something. You know, the, then we need technology. So we try to make sense of the technology we are building. And um, I'm sorry that uh, you know, I might uh, switch the um, you know. Uh, so you can see the whole environment here, and I will skip these slides. So right now, the, what's the global health issues and what are the big issues that we can help to, the, um, to resolve based on the technology? The first one is on the aging, the growth of the, you know, the aging populations. And that's a, you know, the, you know, the huge uh, you know, issues, not for now and also for the future. The second thing is that you can see that because of the urbanizations, and the young people will get used to work in the big city, but uh, you know the elders they prefer to stay in the rural areas. So it creates uh, separations. So the elders need some you know medical care, the mental cares, but their children are in the in, has to work in the city areas, and so such separations will create a huge needs and the telemedicines and also remote health care. Second thing is about globalizations. It's not talking about supply chain globalization. It's talking about you know just like disease like uh, you know that COVID nineteen is spread all over the world, and you need a different kind of technology to track you know the you know the spread and distribution of the the virus, and that's another issues. So one of the things that, that we are trying to do is that we try to make sure that. You know, when a patient they stay at home, because you know once you know the the elders are grow to the uh, you know there are too many you know elders in the world. There is not the enough you know the wards or the hospital to host them. Then they have to you know uh, stay in the home. That's called aging in place. So you have to connect the caregiver, the hospital, and also their social, you know their family all together by technology. 
So you can see that if we want to uh, do more that, uh, you know, the, the future medicine based on the 4P, the prediction, prevention, precision or personalization, personalizations, basically you need uh, special wearable or IoT to take the data out of uh, you know, the human body and then you have to store in the cloud computing and then you can do machine learning and then you can you know, provide algorithm as a service. So for us, device, big data, cloud, and also the um, algorithm is the four most important strategy for quanta right now, for the future. So if we want to put you know, the um, AI medicine in the place you live, then you have to consider a different kind of paradigms, which is that every people stay at home, they only client devices. And then it's a suitable you know, connectivity to, the, to bring the data to the hospital or to the caregivers. And then you have to connect all the professional caregivers together with the family and also your friends all together to form, a, to complete the circle of care around a person. And so that's you know, exactly what we are trying to do and also that that's the system we are trying to build. And also you can see that the big data will be involved in this kind of scenario. And because once you have the big data, and then you, know, you have to consider to the, you know, extract the, label the data, train the data into an, uh, with AI. And then you have to consider to use VR and AR to present the results to the patient directly. And sometimes you need um, edge computing to compute, to do AI computing at the edge as well. So that this is the systems that we are building and we are launching the system globally. And uh, this year, in this August, we're gonna launch a full scale of telemedicine among hospital and from hospital to the home directory uh, in, the, in Yundin, um, Taiwan, together with a national Taiwan uh, University Hospital and other uh, 10 hospitals. And we also install our you know, systems in, the, in Utrecht, in Netherlands, and also in Canada and other places to support the elderly care. And so you can see that we try um, to the, enable the AI medicine and the traditional the hospital to the, help them to transform. Traditional the hospital are very patient-centric. So basically, when a patient go to the hospital, they take, use medical devices to measure it and put the data in the his. And then the you know, doctors based on the data, they do diagnosis, they come up with the treatments. But in the future, when you have more and more IOMT, they create a huge amount of data that your his cannot you know, accommodate. You need a, a separate crowd to do that. And once you have the crowd, then that will be something very doctor-centric, which means that you can label the data doing different kind of modeling, doing different kind of training, you can create a new influencing model through machine learning to help the, you know, help the um, you know, patients through the AI. And so this is the platform that we are building and we are actually trying to incorporate with human intelligence as well to make sure that you know, both AI and also the human intelligence can work at you know, the same time. So we are building another crowd. So this crowd need the, you know, the big data, and we, the, we need the special administration in the hospital called IRB, and the, you need that, you need, we build up a pipeline from training, from labeling, and also you know, developing the uh, validation, and also come up with an uh, inferencing model, and through the OTA, and you uh, deploy the inferencing model to the uh, you know, uh, 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 end devices or medical sensors. And we keep every data in the loop so we can do continuous optimizations of the full you know, AI pipeline from uh, inferencing model generations to, um, to the real, you know, the, uh, a real world of service or point of cares. And so that's exactly what we are trying to build now. And so you can see that uh, we try to define a human-centric um, you know, applications, collect the data, and, uh, and do the machine training and do the deep learning. And so basically, you know, it's, it's an integration of AI together with IoT, so we call it an AIoT. 
But more than that, we try to develop different kind of you know, algorithm to replace the sensors, the hardware. On the left, actually, it's a video you know, that, uh, taken by you know, traditional, very cheap webcam. You can see nothing there. But on the right side, you can see something different by algorithm. If you magnify the small motions of the, you know, the baby, you actually don't really need a sensors to detect you know, the heart rhythm or the heartbeat. You can visualize everything. And that's the power of real-time you know, um, algorithm. Another thing is that for preg pregnant uh, you know, the, uh, ladies, and if they want to you know, magnify to see how their baby moves inside their body, then that's something that we can do. And such technologies you know, that require very, uh, uh, very uh, efficient um, you know, and creative um, algorithm, and also you need a very you know, special, t uh, uh, with this kind of algorithm, you actually can, um, can, uh, uh, can make sure you can enhance the hardware's performance you know, without you know, adding more cost. And so that's another you know, direction that uh, we are doing. We are doing a lot of such uh, uh, um, applications to support the patients. Basically, we try to create a technology not to interfere you know, people's ordinary life, but we still can you know, detect you know, their uh, health care condition, their vital sign through this kind of technology. So I think uh, the best way to predict the future is simply to invent it. So people said that, uh, you know, uh, Einstein had two brains, uh, the left brain and the right brain. But some people always said that the brain has nothing right left, the left brain has nothing right. And if we, uh, you know, and the, the left brain is very close to the logic and technology, another brain is very humanity. And so if we uh, bring, a, bring over a, a brand, we cut it into two pieces and we separate it, you can see that's exactly the technology we try to enable in the order to support the human, the, you know, the, the smart medicine of the future. So basically we are, the, you know, we are looking forward to the work with you know, researchers and also uh, uh, customer globally to enable uh, more uh, um, useful technology and to support the people for the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ted. I think uh, according to your uh, presentation, I think we can uh, clearly uh, see the uh, path, I mean the migration path of a quanta, uh, com yeah, quanta computer. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, and you have already chose the uh, medicine, ha uh, medical hair, uh, uh, health care as one of the most important yes. direction of yes. the future direction. So I think uh, it is quite clear that it's kind of the uh, digital transformation and the, uh, we, can, we can say that is kind of a paradigm shift. Yeah. I'm quite interested in that uh, you have a uh, integrate uh, different uh, services and uh, use uh, AI and uh, other uh, machine learning, uh, other IT uh, technology, and combine with multiple stakeholders uh, within the uh, uh, whole um, new business model. There are so many different um, um, stakeholders inside, yeah. including the uh, doctors, patients, yeah. and uh, other service providers. So I think um, not only not o I think the, the, the problem is not only limited to the technology. No. It's, um, yeah, I think the business model and how to deal with uh, uh, the different uh, stakeholders uh, will be the uh, most important issue. Yeah. Maybe we, uh, you can share with us some about your thoughts uh, yeah. later, right. later, okay. later, okay. yes. Right now we have to move to the uh, second uh, speaker. Our second speaker uh, is the, um, our second speaker uh, is Todd Ling from uh, GIS, um, Sorry, uh, let me find your, uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, telling uh, CTO, Aegis Technology Inc. And uh, 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 Todd, Todd Ling. And uh, his topic is uh, uh, contactless user interface. Uh, the Todd's background is the uh, electronics, right? So uh, I think uh, you will make a, a sharing uh, with us about your company and your technology and your goal and your uh, thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, EGS is uh, one of the uh, leading uh, 
fingerprint sensor provider around the world. Uh, major customer, uh, major brand of handset. Because we are a sensor company, so we commit ourselves to make sensors smarter. Uh, it probably different with all the speaker today, people talking about 5G, talking about collect data to the cloud. We walk different direction. We want to minimize data moving to world cloud. We want sensor make more decision locally instead of rely on somebody in far, far away cloud data center making decision, doing analysis. That, that probably can do something sensor cannot do, but I believe sensor can do a lot that today done by server and data center. So, uh, This, this talk, talking about the, uh, so, so, so let me continue with this. It's uh, due to the uh, coronavirus, uh, people probably change their social conduct from now on. So, uh, uh, several slides disappear. Okay, so taking opportunity of this uh, technical barrier, I, I would like to talk about, because coronavirus stay on variety of service that we will touch or contact every day, they can stay on plastic or stainless for two or three days. So either we, we find a magic globe with uh, antivirus killing ability. Oh, we try to change the way we interact with all kinds of machine, or all kinds of uh, people transaction behavior in countless way. So just name a few of that. We, we have a daily operation, like we go to office, we need to touch the uh, elevator button. We Buy something we need to pay by coin, pay by bill. Still several, still several slides disappear. That's fine. And uh, because virus stay on variety of service for hours or days, so we we find several way can be change our user interface. So, so today, I, 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 I would like to discuss several different approach that we might consider. Uh, one way of that is uh, change from cash transaction to mobile payment. Aegis is one of the uh, board members uh, standing on the uh, international standard organization FIDO. So we define the standard for personal identification or authentication. That, that becomes foundation of mobile payment. Uh, so, so people can pay from device to car reader, or people can pay peer to peer, simply with interchange by, oh, oh, my, my slide come back. Okay. Uh, for, for this slide, you can see coronavirus can stay on several different interface, several hours or even days. And I would like to raise your condition is it stay on a paper car bowl for 24 hours. And it stay on plastic and stainless two or three days, which means you push elevator button in the morning, the virus stay there until you go home. So, so we need to find solution for this. So either you clean the button several hours, or you find a magic glove that can kill virus in, in case you touch something dirty, or we don't touch the thing that we used to touch. So, uh, 
still several slides disappear. <laughs> and this uh, just example for the uh, elevator that I mentioned. So elevator, we try to find another way to control elevator. So one of my colleagues thinking about uh, show your fingers, they go to second floor. But the problem come to if you want to go to 22 floor, you don't have that many fingerprint. You don't have that many finger. So we figure out a voice speech probably a better way to tell elevator that I want to go floor 22 instead of showing many fingers several times and make machine count. Uh, the, the other, if we can make that happen, we probably can improve one of the uh, trouble that senior citizen may have. My mother, every time come to my home, complain she don't know how to turn on TV because too many remote controllers mm -hmm. sit on my living room. Some of them are TV, some of them are cable TV, some of them are set up some of them are Blu-ray Blu player. And she never can understand which HDMI source connect to which box. And she can remember which channel she like to watch. She can remember which channel means HBO, which channel means Discovery. So if we can let machine understand our nature language, we probably can change majority of compliance that we touch today. So luckily, with the all the effort we put in on artificial intelligence, right now we can use only 80 megabyte of line without any internet connection, can understand what people are saying. So with many, many IC today, we can accommodate 80 megabyte. So in case that happen, we probably can let TV listen what we want to see, which program we want to see, instead of finding many, many remote controllers. That is one thing that we might consider to change. Second thing is if we let a appliance can listen what we are talking about, it raises privacy concern. You don't want your washing machine or your air condition listen what you say all day long. Especially TV, people probably spend a lot of time in the living room or bedroom. So think about smart speaker today, Echo, sitting there, either in the living room or in the bedroom, and you, 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 you talk a lot, lot of privacy stuff with your spouse, and, and, and you don't want Amazon record all that in, in cloud, then simply analysis what coffee you want to buy, or let's detect the keyword that you speak to. It seems that my slide come back. OK. Maybe you want to put that slide out onto main screen? OK, I, uh, I'm really excited with this amount of small memory footprint that we can make machine understand our speaking. So this slide talking about one day we probably can get rid of all this remote controller. So with very few memory footprint, we can let machine understand so this is the uh, scenario we like to have someday. You, you simply tell your TV what program you want to see instead of finding a lot of uh, remote. That probably can solve a lot of senior citizen. Or oh, when there's a guest come to your home, kids probably have problem to find the favorite TV program they would like to see. Then come down to the problem is if you want machine understand what you are saying, but you don't want machine to recall everything you say, 
there's a major key word need to be impressed. Something like Alexa, OK Google, Hey Siri, or simply touch. So that machine start to listen. And listen nothing before you give that keyword, before you touch. Why people want to touch? Today we are talking about not to touch, right? So let's leave that option aside. If we don't touch, how to make machine understand he need to pay attention to what we are saying next? A, a keyword come in place. So how to detect a keyword during your continuous conversation? Is if you do it today by digital, you need to periodically pull in what you are saying. If you do it too, too frequently, it consumes a lot of power. It's impractical for small battery power device like earbuds. But if you put it too infrequently, you miss the least sound. So instead of listening, OK Google, you, you, you hear K Google or even you hear Google. So it, it, it may lead to uh, false alarm or false action. It will create a very bad user experience. Since EGC is a sensor company, so we want to solve that problem. We want to use analog AI technology to make machine Lesson keyword in unbelievable low power. So, and only the keyword, nothing else. We don't remember that keyword. We only raise our hand, trigger interrupt when we listen the keyword to let the system start to pay attention. So, this is one way of opportunity from our point of view when this coronavirus hit the worldwide. It probably changed people's social pattern from now on, even we get cured. People probably want to keep distance forever. <laughs> and just share with you, uh, when, when we doing this contactless research, uh, actually we discovered people perceive the world in majority way by vision, 83%. That means when you lose your eyesight, it creates huge problems. The second largest is the hearing. So then it is pretty surprised that smear, even four times bigger than touch. But, but we touch keyboard, we touch our mobile handset every day. So that only sum up for 1%, like we eat something by tasting. So with this discover, you probably want to develop contactless user interface by vision, not only by hearing. So this is my favorite movie scene from the Iron Man in Revenge. This user interface is pretty fascinating. It's a sci-fi movie often lead the direction of technology development. We want to make that happen someday. So in, in this use case, you can see the Iron Man use his hand. So there must be some sort of sensor understand the position of his finger. And also know the 3D position of his finger. Therefore, the display device know where to project the information he designed. And this create a lot of uh, business opportunity for AIoT. Uh, this can be done by 60 gigahertz radar. With a tiny radar smaller than a coin, you can distinguish a fine movement of your finger, like a, you are turning a button, you are sliding a bar, or you click a button, or you flip something. That is a high power, long range sensor. No, no need to nearby you. But on the contrary, you can implement this concept by ultrasonic. 
that probably can do it five meters away from you, still achieve one millimeter accuracy. With radar, probably you can 15 meters away achieve 0 0.3 millimeter accuracy. If this can be deployed massively, cost effectively, it will change people's user interface a lot. Also, Microsoft uh, kidnaps invent the uh, use your human body as joystick instead of like a Sony PlayStation. You, you need to have a joystick to play game. You can use your body as the uh, joystick. Actually, a lot of surveillance camera on the tree use that remote face resolution to identify who you are probably is pretty difficult. But use your body skeleton motion to identify who you are is much easier. Every people walking, sitting, moving in a distinguished way, nobody are identical. So with this, the police probably can catch the thief or robber by the way he moves on the street instead, because the thief usually wear human mask. So when somebody wants to do crime, he won't let you see his face or her face, right? But he cannot change the way he moves by his skeleton suddenly. So this is also very interesting user interface that from our point of view. The other is truck driver, bus driver driving several hours a day. So more and more pressure from legal point of view is one to force that kind of long-term driving vehicle installed an uh, interior driver monitor system. Uh, the good thing is that kind of vehicle often change driver from time to time, so it can adjust seat, mirror, temperature, music with that driver's favor. Uh, in the other hand, when that driver get tired, smoking, talking to the phone, this system can error and recall. So in case of uh, accident happen, you, you can trace what happened that time. This create another business opportunity for AIoT because with that hourly monitor, you don't want to have a light source projection on his light, burning his eye, especially if you use IR. With hours of integration, even the very weak energy can create damage. So just as a summary today is a uh, each is commit in develop analog AI instead of digital AI. We want to move the decision power from remote data center to local as much as we can. And this moving create a much smaller multiplier accumulator, which is mature process friendly. And we discover analog achieve more than 8-bit accuracy, which is good enough for AI inference. It's not good enough for training. People training by 32, 64-bit floating point. Therefore, we can create smart microphone. It can always on watching the keyword in unbelievable low power. We can create smart camera. We can identify who it is. We can put this smart camera on the car to alert you there's a children jumping up, there's a balloon, there's a deer jumping up from the roadside. And also, as I mentioned, the smart gesture can, even you wear globe, you still can move on your smart watch. You can still touch things or comment something by body movement in very close way or by finger in very fine way. So this is my last slide. And uh, I think we already can do this already. Just all the vision come from the VR Herman. Someday when holograph become mature, we probably can see this without Herman. Thank you, everybody.
Okay, thank you, Todd. Uh, what a wonderful hologram word, right? <laughs> as a sensor, as a sensor company, I think uh, each is uh, uh, use the advanced technology, and uh, I think the key word I got is the uh, uh, contactless and uh, uh, distancing. I think uh, these these uh, the key words uh, will be most popular. Uh, uh, application uh, for the time being. I think uh, in the future, maybe uh, it will be, uh, be it will become the new normal. I think, yes. And uh, uh, as the application is very broad, am I right? I think am I right? Yeah. And uh, I think maybe um, it, it it will um, uh, it will I mean uh, related to different kind of smart de devices and other different layers application uh, about IC, ICT. So I think uh, uh, it must be something about the standard. So maybe we can discuss the later. Right now we are moving to the uh, third uh, third speakers, and uh, uh, he, I think uh, this, our third speaker is online, right? The third speaker is uh, Nikola uh, Trivonovic. Uh, he is the uh, software expert from Microsoft, and his topic is building extra extraction from aerial um, imagery. So uh, let's welcome uh, Nikola. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Nikola Trifonovic, and I'm a software engineer in Microsoft working in MAPS organization. And this is the project I'm currently working on. It's building extraction from aerial imagery. And it's just one of the computer vision projects we are working on in my organization because we think this is one of the feasible ways in order to stay up to date with the worldwide huge amount of data, MAPS data uh, that is changing uh, every day. So in this presentation, uh, I'll show our project overview, walk you through some technical details and infrastructure we use for this project, show you some results, some challenges we had, problems, and how we are solving them at the moment. Uh, on this slide, you can see the basic overview of our extraction algorithm. It's, uh, it's a simple two-stage uh, process. The first stage is semantic segmentation, or in other words, uh, the process of predicting for each in pixel in the input image uh, whether it's a building or not. And it is a single responsibility of a single deep neural network. And uh, the stage two we call polygonization. It's the stage uh, when we these uh, predicted pixel blocks convert into the polygons, which are later used by various maps uh, components. And as you can see here, we just do prediction on three channel imagery uh, RGB with RGB colors. Uh, since recently, imagery with additional channels are available, uh, which are very helpful for this scenario, like uh, IR or infrared or even better LiDAR. But usually, uh, the coverage of this imagery is still not that good. So, whenever you, if you still plan to do uh, the uh, extraction on wide uh, areas, uh, uh, RGB channel imagery is way to go. <clears throat> So let's dive a little bit with technical details regarding semantic segmentation. Uh, here you can see some of the DNNs uh, we used. And at the moment, we are settled with the FishNet with UNet upsampling uh, layers. Uh, basically, what we do here, basically, we reuse uh, the DNNs uh, architectures, which are produced by research community. Previously, we used to tweak these networks uh, to tweak the layers so uh, the networks uh, work better for this specific domain. Uh, and we obtain some minor improvements, uh, but as time goes by, uh, research produce much better models. So we decided that it's much better investment for our side on infrastructure. So we built an infrastructure around uh, training so that we can easily plug and play any new networks that becomes available. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, build uh, infrastructure regarding training. And these networks are trained uh, uh, like you provide them the imagery and corresponding uh, la labeling mask. Basically, you're saying to the network, it's supervised learning, you're saying to the network, okay, on this kind of imagery, I want you to detect uh, these kind of pixels. 
And the detail here is that we use uh, images of resolution around 30 centimeters per pixel. Uh, even in those areas we do, where we don't have the imagery of such resolution, in that case we extrapolate to this because uh, we want our neural network to uh, work with consistent uh, building uh, sizes. <clears throat> Uh, as I mentioned, how the training is trained, uh, it's trained with labeled regions, and usually what you obtain is uh, labeled buildings. So uh, whenever you deal with the label set, you need to make sure uh, that this, that uh, the labeling is done, that you have the regions that are fully labeled. So uh, you, you cannot work with data sets which just have sporadic labels. So in, in, for every region you're working on, uh, all the labels inside it uh, needs to be labeled. And usually the labeling sets come with this area of interest. Uh, but uh, if that's not the case, then you need to figure out some concave HAL algorithm to a little bit manually tweak it uh, so you know these areas where you can sample from. And uh, how do we sample uh, the... Uh, uh, put big attention to diversity, so we need to have a specific ratio from urban areas, rural areas, and also different landscape, uh, forestry, hills, uh, uh, sunny fields, and others. Uh, and usually these labels only come in some residential areas, and when you apply the model that uh, usually can be applied in various areas, forests, glacials, and everything else. So that's why, in addition, we add these true negative samples. Basically, we take some regions where we know uh, the wasteland is, uh, and we just assume that there are no buildings there. So our network can also work correctly on this uh, type of imagery. And the training set sizes we work on are around 1 million uh, images. So the second stage is polygonization algorithms. Depending on your scenario, maybe uh, something simple algorithm like Douglas Packer can work for you. Uh, it's a greedy algorithm and it can simplify the uh, building outline. But since uh, we put our predictions on the map as well, we have uh, this additional property of the building that this prediction need actually to look like building that uh, have these um, angles, uh, which are most common 90 degrees, uh, and in order to produce such a labels, uh, you need some different approach uh, that uh, will be able to look at the building in the global context and not make uh, greedy decisions. And this is like uh, uh, one of the algorithms we create for this task, which is available as a library and everybody uh, can use it. Uh, so, uh, once uh, we produce pin polygons, so we need to figure out the evaluation metrics. So first thing we do once we produce predictions, we try to match them with the labels. And depending on how many buildings we matched, we calculate precision and recall. And for those, and regarding the quality for those buildings that we matched, uh, we need to uh, calculate the quality metrics. For that, we use intersection over union, which is a standard for this type of uh, problem, but also we added additional metrics like shape distance and rotation angle, because again, these buildings will be placed on map. So even like square and hexagon can have a high coverage, uh, the user uh, different shape uh, can create a big dissatisfactions for the user and consumers of the data. Uh, once uh, the matrix are produces uh, and you are satisfied with the results, the following stage is just to apply the model uh, across huge amount of imagery. In our case, it, it is uh, several hundreds of terabytes of imagery. And of course, for this kind of task, you need the infrastructure which can parallelize uh, the work for you. Uh, for that, uh, we use Azure and we parallelize, parallelize our <clears throat> extraction on several hundred uh, GPUs. Uh, and while developing this infrastructure, we figure out that other customers might also find it very useful. So we made it a very customizable. So for example, if you are working uh, on some model which predicts some maps imagery, for example, pools or whatever uh, your business scenario is, uh, we enable this TIA platform solution for you, basically where you can provide just your Dockerized solution uh, and we can deal everything else for you. Um, either so depending on the imagery you use you can upload that imagery uh, in the cloud or if you're using a particular tile api you can configure that uh, into uh, this platform <clears throat> and once we extract made uh, the extractions available uh, we usually 
put, put those extractions on GitHub. Uh, but since these extractions are very bulky and large in size, uh, we also added this API, which you can access it uh, basically for any area of interest. Uh, this API can retrieve uh, the buildings that we extracted. And this is one uh, feature that is used by OSM community, OSM OpenStreetMap community, uh, which, creating the which is creating the open maps and using our output to enrich uh, the open data. Also, this uh, uh, API was integrated into Rapid, uh, developed by Facebook. Uh, this is just extension of OSM ID editor, uh, where uh, editors can review the buildings we produce and also the Facebook roads. Uh, uh, so, and uh, all, with all the attention of uh, uh, ML, uh, in, uh, on making this uh, using uh, just basically uh, using ML to uh, to make uh, labeling process much faster, and one interesting uh, scenario for this tool is once the label is tweaked by the editor, then the information can be returned back to us uh, for the active learning scenarios. <clears throat> so on this slide, you can see some of the examples uh, of extractions we did so far. First, we did the uh, USA. Uh, we used the data set of 10 million buildings, which is also publicly available on the GitHub in the US. We extracted 125 million buildings. And uh, this data set was also featured in New York Times where they use it to uh, provide some social and history aspects of how the United States uh, developed. Uh, you can see down very good results, very good recall intersection over union. And uh, mainly a contribution to such a good result is uh, that a large amount of buildings, around 33%, is under very good imagery. And you will see later that the quality of the imagery you're working on is very important. So the next step, uh, we did Canada in collaboration with Canada government. They provided us the labels, so we just repeated the, the same process. Uh, here is some, see the results are a little bit worse than America, but the reason is that uh, a much larger amount of imagery is uh, placed on low resolution imagery where it is very sometimes very hard even to the human mind to detect uh, what is a building and what not. So uh, uh, the, our next uh, project uh, was a part of a larger uh, Microsoft in humanitarian initiative uh, and uh, our assignment was to extract buildings in Tanzania and Uganda as part of this humanitarian effort. But this experience was completely different because this is the first time we worked without any labels available. In Canada and US, we had a lot of labels, but here we have none. And when we apply the models we train on Canada and USA on this imagery, uh, the results are pretty bad. And we contribute that to completely different imagery, completely different land landscape, residential structures, and everything else. So uh, this is one of the property of the Indians where they don't generalize well on the unseen imagery. Uh, we looked for additional data from the OSM community, but uh, we found a lot of problems with this data. Some of these uh, can be seen on the slide. So uh, with the help from our partners for humanitarian organization, we decided to create uh, the data set from scratch. Then they helped us from that, for that. And in order to create this data set more representative, because we want, again, to uh, cover samples from various urban areas, uh, we use uh, this population data set from Center of uh, International Earth Science Information Network, uh, where basically this data set contains uh, a render map of population across the core globe. And depending on this data set, you can deduce uh, which are the rural, which are the urban areas, and that we use to create a, a representative sample uh, for this uh, job. <clears throat> and here are some additional uh, labeling efforts uh, we did. So in the end, we uh, created a data set of, of around 40K uh, buildings. Uh, as, and as you can see, demanded around 233 labeler hours, which is uh, pretty much big. Uh, and it's very expensive, um, expensive project. <clears throat> And uh, the, here you can see the final results compared to Canada and US. You see 
the big drop in recall. Uh, we contribute that to the smaller training sizes and uh, to the worse imagery. But when we did an error analysis, uh, we also noticed because of the bad imagery, it's very hard sometimes when the buildings are close by to uh, decay. You, we usually produce one building and actually three labels are present. Uh, so in order to deal with this, uh, we also in addition created this instant segmentation network. And basically what this means is uh, the network that will separate the connected buildings. Is the same network uh, we use for building detection. You just now have different job. Instead of uh, recognizing the building, it needs to recognize the edges. And when we and basically we use the same um, training sets, but when we don't when creating the building mask, we don't create building masks. So we create edges masks. And how we uh, we just ran two models. So we use edges to split uh, the predicted pixels. Uh, ones that's, that are our seeds for the buildings, and then we assign back uh, the edges to the closest uh, build, building seed. And uh, with this kind of approach, uh, uh, our recall increased a lot, and here are the new results uh, uh, available. In the meantime, we uh, integrated these two networks into one, uh, which is much better from perspective of applying it to imagery. It, will, it of course reduces the extraction time uh, it reduces by half. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are also other alternatives, different networks like MASK, RCNNs, but they seem too complicated. Uh, and uh, since we do extraction or the extraction of very large tiles, which can have around 1,000 imagery, the MASK, RCNN uh, can be problematic for, for this purpose. <laughs> so, uh, when we started working on Africa, the big problem we noticed is this domain shift problem. So DNNs don't generalize well uh, when they're applied on imagery, which are not present in the training set. They produce uh, results with uh, a regressed performance. And that, that will all come, you know, that, that will happen every time we do this. And uh, this happens because the imagery we apply on has different color and styles. The cameras are used, the camera are used, they are different. And also it's not just like when we go from market to market that it will be different. Uh, tomorrow when the new imagery for, for example, United States become available, it will be different. And this kind of development market, but market is not scalable in, in the long run. <clears throat> So uh, this is one of the solution, how we plan to deal with this. Uh, we just plan to uh, train one model using all data available uh, to, and make it very robust, using very smart uh, data augmentation to produce it. Uh, and with configurable sampling priorities from different imagery sources. And uh, the other stage is once we have this robust model, which pretty much works well across the board, is to, the, to have this specific image domain adaptation, which can, use, can, which can also be done without labels. So without that labeling costs I cost showed you uh, in the Africa, using only uh, imagery without labels. And uh, this is, in research produces a lot of interesting papers are, are regarding this. Sometimes some of them are based on entropy, some on, on style transfer. And we are now testing this on one particular market and it shows very promising results. Soon we will follow up with it. And uh, with this approach, we plan to uh, finally create uh, the footprints for the whole world. <clears throat> Uh, but even when we solve this problem, there will be still some problems mentioned on this slide, like uh, poor image quality, outdated imagery, natural covering, all of these things, even with perfect technology, uh, some of these things, it will be hard to mitigate. Of course, uh, when time goes, uh, I, I suppose we will have better and better imagery, uh, but this outdated problem will still prevail <clears throat> because Usually, uh, the imagery you can see it's several years old. So yeah, this is the summary of it. Uh, we in Microsoft strongly believe that computer vision technologies are a way to go to deal with uh, scale problem of worldwide ma changing map data. I think the technology is is now there, and we have some very good experimental results. And yeah, we will be happy to share as soon as possible with you. 
Thank you. OK, thank you, Nicola. Thank you for your sharing. Now we are moving to the uh, fourth speaker. Our, uh, the fourth speaker is uh, Santosh uh, Mallison, Associate Fellow Technology and Product Development, Verizon. And his topic is Computer Vision for IoT Camera. Let me introduce the Santosh. Santosh Mallison is an Associate Fellow in Verizon Technology and Product Development Organization. He works in the Emerging Technologies Group and his current focus on computer vision and location technologies. He holds over a dozen patents in the areas of security and analytics, and his current role with Verizon has filed for multiple patents in the areas of computer vision, location, and the blockchain. OK, thank you. Welcome, uh, Santosh. Give us uh, your sharing cameras. So in recent times, um, there's been a lot of progress across multiple different um, technology domains that's making it possible for computer vision to be applied in a truly distributed fashion. Uh, we, we know the smart devices, the smartphones are getting uh, more and more capable of running uh, computer vision models uh, natively. Um, there's also a lot of advancements happening on the um, chip friends for inference chips that can, um, that can utilize really low power and be um, very capable of running uh, pretty complex models. Um, recent advances in 5G is also opening up a new domain of mobile edge compute uh, because of the low latency and high bandwidth connectivity that it uh, produces. Um, so this, this is all coming together to truly create a ripe environment for applying computer vision across a um, lot of wide variety of applications for IoT. Um, a brief prologue. So why, why computer vision for IoT? IoT already has um, a lot of uh, sensors, you know, thousands of sensors that can um, look for a wide variety of conditions. In one word, it's really, a picture is worth a thousand words. I got two pictures here. Uh, one's uh, one showing the industrial environment, IoT, and one's more of a consumer IoT environment. Um, the reason you would want to use uh, computer vision in IoT is because a single picture can track uh, various objects. Um, you know, most of the times the sensors, uh, individual IoT sensors, are limited to a small subset of conditions that they are sensing for. Um, with the, with the picture, you can, you can track um, various objects. You can look at the state of the asset. Uh, you can look for safety conditions. Um, and you can also look for interaction between objects, uh, which if you look for any other type of dedicated IoT sensors, it it's becomes very complex. Uh, so for example, on the picture on the left here, on the industrial um, IoT type of environment, um, you can see if a forklift has a person in it or not. So that's an interaction between the object that, um, that it can, can be, um, a picture can be used to detect. And also images make um, catch all observations, right? So you, you might be intending to use the image for a particular type of um, detection uh, or sensing a particular type of condition. Um, but since the image catches everything else, you can actually go back and later on do some other type of uh, sensing from those images. And when you combine the images with contextual data, you can, you can gain additional situational awareness. Uh, for example, on the consumer IoT uh, image on the right side, so if you, if you combine um, a contextual data that, you know, it's a, it's a senior citizen uh, living in a house and they should not be in a prone position for too long of a time in the middle of the floor. That gives you a situational awareness that something has gone wrong. So this allows for automating, automating um, really complex tasks.
some really, really quick intros on some of the terminologies used, um, just, just to make sure the audience is aware of, aware of um, the technologies used in these slides. Um, computer vision, so what do we talk about? Um, when we say computer vision, what are we really talking about? Um, it's really the most common computer vision tasks are um, classification and labeling. Um, they are really variants of the same thing. You, know, you look at the image and you, you tell what's in it. Um, so whether, whether the image is a cat or a dog. Um, detection recognition is another most common thing. It's you not only recognize what's in the image, you also have localization that, that puts a, some sort of bonding box of the object inside the image. And tracking is really doing either classification or detection across a uh, timeline. There are, there are obviously a lot of other uh, computer vision tasks, but these are kind of the most common ones used in the IoT applications. Um, the, the IoT applications that are ripe for computer vision are for safety compliance. Um, for example, in the industrial environment, if, um, if a human comes um, too dangerously close to an operating forklift, that's a, that's a safety compliance issue. Um, you can use it for def defect monitoring. Um, when, you, when you have a manufacturing um, assembly line producing um, a lot of different things, it can be used for defect monitoring. Asset monitoring, it can be used in like retail, retail environments where it's looking, looking at the assets, whether assets are getting depleted from the shelves. Um, analytics um, in smart smart city type of environment, you can use a lot of lot of different analytical uh, information, you know, for whether a particular uh, intersection, how heavily trafficked it is, whether there is more of more car traffic, more bicycle traffic, those type of analytics. So all of these IoT type of applications, computer vision is really ripe um, to be applied for. Mobile edge compute. So what do we mean by mobile edge compute? It's really uh, edge compute refers to a processing capacity that exists very close to the user. Um, so you can define that edge in many different ways. You know, if you have a smartphone that's running a lot of different things locally, that's, that's really an edge compute as well. A mobile edge is when, um, when you have an edge that's really not capable of, of running um, complex tasks because of either compute limitations or power limitations, you can kind of move that edge a little bit uh, away from the actual device, uh, but still very close to the device using connectivity, uh, especially with 5G and the ultra low latency it provides and the large bandwidth it provides. Um, it's it, you know, the, the edges, it may be away from the physical device, but it's still pretty close. And the, and the mobile edge compute allows for applications and services to be accelerated. So computer vision at the edge, how is it designed? Um, so today, the CV at, at, CV at the edge uh, designed um, how it shows on the, on the left here. So you have a camera and it's uh, the feed from the camera goes into an IoT gateway that does some inference. And the results of that goes into cloud for further processing. Uh, and sometimes you have the camera and the IoT gateway and the inference system all um, coupled together um, in, a, in a single system. Um, so this is, this is the example for this is like the Jetson Nano, the TX1, TX2 from the NVIDIA, um, Qualcomm Snapdragon processors, Raspberry Pis can be um, attached to cameras. So these are things, um, that are mostly OEM software on top of a really fragmented system on a chip type of space. Uh, what, we, what we propose is a, is a better, uh, what we think is a better mobile edge compute design that also scales for legacy IoT cameras. So this is where a camera actually uh, connects to a mobile um, edge compute cloud service that provides the inference. And the mobile edge compute is a rich CV system environment and it, it provides you with everything a cloud paradigm provides you.
So if you look at the computer vision at the edge application stack, um, so if you look at the vertical stack of each one of these, um, they're identical. Um, but if you look at the application stack itself, you, it can, it's composed of these functionalities. So you, uh, you know, obviously you have the camera, the camera is uh, feeding the signals into some sort of uh, computer vision engine or a model. Um, and, the, and the model determines whatever um, it's designed to do, and it creates some metadata. And that metadata needs to be analyzed and an actual actuation needs to happen. So in an IoT type of environment, most of the time what you're doing is when a computer vision detects something, you need to take some action based on that. And once the actuation layer is passed, you know, you have, you, you have other um, analytics and prediction layers that are running on the cloud, which are not really time sensitive. Uh, and they aggregate data across uh, many different IoT devices, in this case, camera. And obviously some dashboard or UI of some sort that brings it all together. So these are roughly the components of a computer vision application. Um, that runs on the edge. Um, what we have here is the, the four different ways you can slice and dice these functionalities. Um, so when you, when you have an ultra low latency requirement, uh, that means you know, less than 20 milliseconds from the time an image appears on the camera and the time you're, you're making the actuation decision, you most of the time would want to run this thing on the edge device itself. Um, and you know, if you have um, some somewhat better latency um, requirement, you know, you, the latency can be in tens of milliseconds. You may still want to run the model on the on the edge device, but run some of the compute um, compute intensive analytics on a mobile edge compute in, environment and run the actuations from there. Um, so. The, again, the flexibility this is going to provide you is the actuation layer is not um, in each of the edge device itself. So it, it's in the cloud and it becomes easier to manage. And the, the right two boxes are two different environments where you're really talking about an edge device that's, that's um, you know, really a dumb camera. It's not, it's, it's not doing anything other than just uh, capturing images and the computer vision itself is running either on a Mac or on a cloud. And whether, where you are running those is really dependent on your application itself. If you have a uh, safety critical actuation application uh, or, or a safety critical process control, you would want to run it on a Mac. Um, if you have a more general computer vision use case, it's conducive to be running it on the cloud. So the rest of the slides, uh, we're, what we're really going to be looking at is um, the computer vision engine, the, the, the second box from the bottom, how we architect it um, so that it's, it scales for, for all these environments. Um, if you look at the computer vision engine um, requirements, it's really made up of uh, three different um, components, uh, major components. You have the actual neural network engine. Um, that's, it needs to be capable of running multiple models. It needs to be capable of running models trained on different deep learning frameworks and obviously any type of um, auto scaling type of environments. Um, the neural network uh, engine obviously works with actual trained models. So a, a CV engine needs to be able to have capabilities for adding these new models in a pretty um, easy fashion. The third component is the actual video processing pipeline. So when you get a stream of um, data coming from a camera, you need to be able to determine what to do with the stream. So you, you, know, you don't want to be running uh, computer vision on every frame of, uh, of the stream itself. And again, this, this is going to be based on how, how tolerant your application is. You know, on a, on a simple anomaly detection type of application, you, you might be okay with running one frame per second, uh, but some, some kind of um, defect detection on a assembly line needs, may mean need to run you know, 10 or 20 frames per second. And obviously across all of these different functions, you, know, you want these components to independently scale 
and you want these components to use hardware in an efficient fashion. And this picture kind of brings it all together. Uh, this decomposes the, the three major components uh, we talked about in the previous slide. Uh, it talks about all the different uh, individual components that are software components that are going in here. Um, so on the left here is all the video sources and the image sources that can go into a computer vision engine. Um, the video pipeline really interfaces with the neural network engine. It, it, it stays in between the video source and the neural network engine. It provides a wide variety of functionalities. Um, you might have uh, things like complex things like scene understanding, uh, where you're really looking at scene boundaries to determine um, what needs to be detected. Uh, you, or you might have you know, fairly simpler frame processing. You just specify how many frames per second you want to, you want to process. Um, and obviously, you, you have other uh, normal things like you know, long-term storage of the video itself. You overlay stream the video out uh, to downstream consumption and so on. And this all need to be tied together with an API layer where an orchestration layer can come in and really use this like a Lego blocks uh, to put an application together. And the video pipeline um, interfaces with neural network engine um, through, again, API layers. And the, and the reason for API layer integration here is, you know, you might have a single image coming through uh, from a frame processing uh, module but you may want to run multiple um, models on them. And you know, it's possible that these models are coming uh, from uh, different uh, sources and they could be running on different um, deep learning frameworks. Um, so you, you would normally want to support all the common uh, deep learning frameworks and obviously TensorFlow, PyTorch is up there, CAFE, Onyx, um, you know, all, all of those needs to be supported. And we have Darknet in here as well, because uh, Darknet is um, the base for the popular YOLO framework. And it's pretty uh, popular within the industrial IoT type of environment. And all of this is tied together by an API layer that kind of normalizes access to all the different uh, frameworks in the models by abstracting um, you know, really to a specific computer vision task, whether it's a classification task or it's a detection task or it's a segmentation task and so on. The other view of the same uh, computer vision architecture is more of a platform component view. So the previous slide talked about um, different software functional components and uh, but th this, this slide is really depicting the same thing in terms of platform components. Uh, from platform component perspective, uh, this may look familiar to most people who, who use uh, web scale uh, architectures. So this is still, um, that you have different, different uh, machines, the actual physical hosts, um, they could be running on hardware, whether it's GPU or CPU hardware. Um, and there's a host OS, which has Docker, and it's, this is all orchestrated together with the Kubernetes. And the auto scaling is again um, given by uh, Kubernetes. So the the whole architecture looks identical to pretty much a standard web scale architecture. So what are the benefits uh, for um, this type of computer vision engine? Um, you know, a it provides us a way to to scale from uh, either a uh, Mac environment, mobile edge compute environment, or a far cloud environment. Uh, they are loosely coupled through APIs, the individual components. So you can uh, easily run multiple models, you know, either, either in parallel or daisy chain fashion. Um, they're all controlled through the APIs themselves. Um, by running these um, on a cloud type of environment, you, get, you can get an easy A-B testing type of uh, scenario where you can easily plug and play different models um, and test them out. And you can scale these components independently. So for example, you might have um, multiple cameras coming in from a factory floor, but if you are really uh, only uh, needing a you know, one, per, one frame per second type of environment, you could run um, 
less instances of the actual inference on the GPU, just saving the saving on uh, GPU compute cost. Um, you can scale these on appropriate hardware. So these these individual software components are um, containerized um, individually. So the the video, for example, the video processing container could be running on a different hardware compared to the neural network container that's running on a hardware with the GPU. And you can scale them on appropriate clouds as well. So the compute the um, video processing container could decide if it's a process. Um, the safety critical uh, uh, application, that particular part of the model can be running right on the Mac. And if it's more of a, um, you know, a monitoring or analytics type of model, it can be accessed on the far cloud. And this whole architecture enables us to be hardware and uh, cloud platform agnostic. Um, we, we can run this on a Mac or we can, we can run it on a, on a far cloud. And the application layer is unaware of what the execution environment is. So um, when the developers who are using this um, to run um, or to build their applications on top, it's a single API interface for them, whether it's running on a Mac or whether it's running on a far cloud. And by adopting this uh, CV engine architecture, um, we really, uh, letting the CV expert focus on the actual CV model development and, and not worry about the inference execution. That would be the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you, uh, Santosh. Um, okay, here in Taipei, uh, we have uh, Ted and Todd will join us uh, into the uh, short uh, panel discussion. Um, as you are all the uh, expert of AI and computer convention, I think um, my first question is that uh, as an expert of AI and the computer com uh, vision, computer vision, can you share us in, um, is there anything or more things uh, we can help in the pandemic of uh, COVID-19? Uh, okay. okay. I think, uh, um, Computer vision, I, I, I mean, the computer vision or even the audio as an input is very important and um, for the uh, people to recognize not only their behavior, sometimes we can extract the features like uh, vital sign signals uh, from the computer visions. And actually, it's, it's a non in, in uh, uh, it's actually, it's a contactless way to understand the situation, the behavior and many things. So. We use um, in uh, in quanta. We use many uh, you know computer, and uh, doing imaging processing as a service over the internet. And sometimes we do it at the edge site, and for different kind of applications. And I'll say that uh, this is very um, um, important um, to the monitor the pe people's uh, vital signs in the order in the order to understand the symptoms, and then we can uh, can do more you know preventative, um, you know, uh, uh, medicine in advanced. And I think, uh, I think computer vision is getting more and more important in this, this area, especially if we want to monitor uh, a group amount of people and to see what's going on over there. For example, if we put a camera here and we try to understand 10, maybe the hundreds of people here, whether their temperature, body temperature is way too high or low, that is one thing. Second thing is that, can you the money, can you the, you know detect something from their behavior, the way they walk, the gesture, the posture? That is another things, and so the, I, I think uh, to dig out the context uh, under beneath the regions, uh, uh, you, you know that you collected is very important, and which is uh, the things that we try to do. And I think that's uh, the new algorithm and, and AI can help in that sector. I think ICT technology can help a lot, right? Oh, thank you. Yeah, and uh, how about Todd? Yeah. Or we, we see the near IR spectrum or even far IR spectrum probably can help in uh, helping people defense coronavirus. Initially, we developed that kind of technology, want to detect the fruit in mm. supermarket, mm. either be contaminated or too many drugs remain. But we discover people, in addition to get fever, coughing, he probably has some different movement mm. 
mm. when he get infected. Mm. So if we can put that sensor in everybody's handset with near IR or far IR detection. So we don't need to rely on institutional camera, like a thermal camera in the entrance of each building, custom supermarket. We can use our handset to detect people nearby me mm -hmm. may have some abnormal phenomenon. So you probably can be get attention, keep keep social distance. So I, I see computer vision can help a lot. Yes, I think so. I think when the uh, special uh, situation for the time being became to into new normal, maybe uh, the application will booming. It will boom. Yeah, a lot of uh, application will come out. Then I think uh, let's go into the second question. Um, regarding to the web technologies, we can see there are many web standards and applications that are related to AI or computer vision. So my second question is that, can you share with us what is the most potential standards uh, and applications for AI and computer vision? What are the opportunities for Taiwan and the global industry to focus on? Okay, uh, Aegis is uh, one of four members of FIDO International Standard. So the mission of that international organization is try to make people get rid of password forever. Using your facial recognition, fingerprint as a key instead of a meaningless. As long as it's meaningful, it becomes easy to attack. Mm. So, but it's very difficult for people to remember meaningless number alphabet. But once that bio sign become a key, so then raise privacy concern. So where facial is a good sign as a key, you walking on the street, a lot of surveillance camera taking your face every day. So I really don't consider that's a good key. So fingerprint, probably one of that. And movement, probably one of that. So right now, a very hot topic in FIDO organization is the uh, authentication and remote binding. So more and more government want to electronize their ID card. But the problem raised is you are in location A, but authentication need to be done at location B. And you want to uh, erase that privacy concern. So recently, this become a very, very hot topic in FIDO international discussion. Tons of people flow in, uh, paying attention, uh, put their opinion there. So we see this probably is the next big thing for AIoT and bioscience. Thank you. Um, I think uh, the first things that uh, I, would like to, I would like to make this, you know, the, uh, to broaden, further broaden this, uh, uh, these questions. I think this is a very good question. First of all is that um, um, more and more sensors coming out uh, in the market. So just like a 60 gigahertz millimeter wave and also the IR and some others. So everything will connect it to the web because the beauty of web is because it's, it's cross-platform. So easy for us to use different kind of, of display and create applications and leverage the data you collected. And then you try to stream the data. And uh, of course, there are some encoding and uh, encryptions that you have to make. And also there are some authentication problems. Whether the authentication should be done at the edge or inside the cloud, it all depends on the application and services. So basically, take uh, you know the medical for example. The most important thing is that take Taiwan for example. There are many different kind of his systems. Different hospitals they have their own, mm. you know, the data and how they can share the data to each other and to create a bigger you know, um, data set in the order to create applications around it. So there are some standards 
you know, around how to, you know, make sure that everybody follow the same table for data is changed. Yes. So data is changed is another thing mm -hmm. because that is the basis for collaboration. Yes. And so, so when we talk, we, we talk about, you know, the future AI, and of course we can use, you know, the minimum, you know, data set to create the application. That is one direction. But before that happens, you still need huge amount of data, leverage huge amount of data, dig out the value, and create the algorithm, and make sure the algorithm can run in a hybrid environment. Sometimes it's private, sometimes it's, mm. it's public, and sometimes even at the edge or inside the sensor. So there are many different ways to do that. So, but, but the most important thing is that, you know, data has changed, yes. it's very important, and depends on the problem, you know, the time critical, you know, the uh, 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 dependency of the problems, then you will move the algorithm around, you know, the systems. So it's, uh, there are many applications, but for Taiwan, because Taiwan, the good thing for Taiwan is that, that Taiwan has one of the biggest and uh, you know the, the data set around healthcare in the world, and it's very complete. And so, basically, um, how to leverage that as the core competency and use that to the, uh, further enhance um, uh, medical care or the you know the is another things. The good thing is that we currently, I think, uh, you, you know, our government they are they, they try to collect more imaging data. Yes. For more applications, yes. so which means that you know the the, the uh, X-ray the films and even the uh, you know the, the pathology films, and also the DICOMs, PECs, they all centralize. They try to create more value out of the data we all already collected for the past uh, thirty years, and that's another things to consider. So. Uh, authentication is one thing, uh, security is one thing, privacy is one thing, but other things to consider is that uh, how people can exchange the data uh, without to the infringe the privacy and also you know the, uh, the data leakage issues, and that's another things to consider. Yeah. yeah. Echo to uh, the, <clears throat> the uh, Ted opinion. Uh, I usually say that right now we are facing the uh, hybrid hybrid uh, issues yeah, very complicated, and different layers, different uh, uh, different uh, segment, different point of view. So I think uh, we need to collaborate with uh, uh, multiple stakeholders together. And right now we are entering into the internet and the digital economy era. Uh, besides the, um, today we learned lots uh, from our experts uh, uh, talking about the uh, technology uh, and uh, application and some application. But at the same time, I would like to remind that the humanity, ethic, and how to build up a trusted uh, environment uh, of our uh, application, I think that will be a big issue in the future. Let's uh, make our efforts together. So uh, thank you for uh, joining us uh, today's AIoT track of uh, Web Conference 2020. Thank you. Bye-bye.